here. So we will go ahead and get started with our special work session tonight uh, regarding the comprehensive plan that y'all might be familiar with. Uh, who's, who's starting tonight? Okay, Mr. Sefco. Thank you, Mr. Cameron. My name is Dan Sefco. Um, we're going to dispense with all the background. Uh, Mike Bell and I have, over several meetings, provided the Planning and Zoning Commission with the background and how we got here. So um, what I thought I'd do is set this up for how we're going to proceed this evening. But before we got started, I, uh, we're, we're very proud of how the website's coming along. And I just wanted to show you all. Uh, Susan Sebastian is going to show us a few pages just to give you an idea of how it's coming along. We're uh, excited about how it looks and um, the readability of it. Thought we'd just show you that just to get started here this evening. Christina? Thank you, Mr. Sesco. Um, so this is our new comprehensive plan draft website. Um, hard to see. There you go. The, uh, the URL, planocompplan.org. And the home page just has a basic introduction. Um, some information on some pages to, to direct people to to learn more about what's, what's changed and what's in the plan. Um, eventually, we'll provide public input opportunities through an online survey and telephone town hall. Um, and then, of course, we'll have adoption hearings as those things are scheduled. Um, we're still working through some things on the website, so uh, forgive us as we, as we continue to, to refine this website. Um, and even let us know if you see anything significantly wrong that you run into. We're, we're doing that ourselves. Um, the structure of the website is here. Uh, again, as you know, the, the plan structure is very similar to the previous comprehensive plan. Uh, we have 11 components now under our five pillars. And then we direct folks to the major changes. Uh, a lot of this is covered from it's the executive summary. So the idea is that the, the plan lives on the website fully the same as in the, the paper document. So people can get more information about things here in that we'll, we'll have status updates on actions and uh, links and resources beyond that. Um, real quick, I'll just go to, through uh, the sections of the, plan, of the website. Uh, the plan has the executive summary, vision and guiding principles, all the pillars and components, and the glossary. And this page here kind of just describes about the draft plan, links to the PDF if people would prefer to, to view it that way, as well as the executive summary. Um, the, uh, the guiding vision guiding principles are here, and then an overview of the plan structure. And a little bit of information on what people should expect to find on these plan pages, an overview of the maps, and then a link to the glossary. And then just real quick, I'll go to a, uh, a policy in here. On the left side, there's, there's a, a menu for people to, to kind of navigate themselves around the, the plan so that they can get to different pillars and policies under each component. Um, and then the page itself will have, this, this is an, a stamp that's really just for the draft plan so that people can see what what's really changed, what was part of the four topic areas that CPRC was, was tasked to, to look at. Um, and then the actions for each policy and status updates for each of them. Uh, not is associated with the, with the policy and then policy resources and partners. And then on this section, we have all of our maps, the five maps. And there's a, there's, it's, each of these maps versus before, you had to click on the PDF to get the additional pages. We've really built them into the site um, so that you can just look at the web page if you want to. Um, and there's links to the PDF and everything here as well. Um, each, each of the dashboards also has their own page um, with some extra navigation menus. But the, the main use mixed charts, the character defining elements, those are all listed on these pages. Um, and then last, well, almost last, uh, the Explore section has uh, some basic demographic information and then information that's largely from the executive summary. So what, what's changed, what's the same, 
uh, an overview of what density is, because uh, that was something that we, we wanted to make sure people understood how we here in Plano, how we measure density, and it also includes a, quite a few examples. These were in your packet this evening in a, in a PDF format. Um, and then frequently asked questions. We will provide details on the existing land use and housing inventory, and we're hoping to create some, some interactive tools for people to, to really get into that data more. Those aren't ready yet, but still in development. Uh, reference materials and acknowledgments. And then lastly, the Connect page is coming soon, uh, but this is where we plan to, to really put all the information about uh, the survey and the Telephone Town Hall and any uh, public hearing for approval. Okay. No Thank you, Justine. I know you all worked very hard on that. I um, mm -hmm. want to thank all the Planning and Zoning Commission members that sent in uh, the questions. We have 17 questions in your packet um, that we've tried to answer best we can. And so I think what we would like to do this evening is we have staff, uh, consultant, uh, we have Mike Bronsky, uh, the vice chair of the CPR uh, in attendance tonight. Uh, we would just like to uh, pitch this back to the Planning and Zoning Commission and let you all ask questions. We've done a lot of presentations, but um, is there anything that we've missed in our answers back to you in the packet that you've received? It's in your packets. But also, did you have any new questions that you uh, wanted to pose to us? We'll try to answer them tonight. If not, we can uh, get back with you in the next next round. Um, I'll turn it back over to you all, Mr. Chairman. Okay. I'm sure everybody's got questions, comments, concerns. Uh, I'm not sure the best way to go about it, but we've got plenty of time to do it tonight. So uh, let me just start and ask with the questions that were given to us. Uh, in our memorandum, does anybody need any more information or follow-up information on the questions and the answers that were provided? <clears throat> Alex? Yeah, um, I had uh, raised the question that uh, uh, the emphasis of the plan, the overall emphasis of the plan, uh, more or less globally, was uh, on land use policies regarding res residential uh, um, avenues for the city and where we would be going over the next 30 years. But I felt like um, we need to hear from the development staff um, in terms of their overall feeling about uh, the short-term and the long-term approach to our employers and the employment districts that we have that have developed in the city, uh, specifically the legacy area, the 121 area, and the uh, Plano Parkway, um, Bush Freeway area. And I was hoping we'd have a little more of a flushed out discussion from um, Sally Bain's department um, because we had a discussion four weeks ago about what the current state of affairs were in terms of what corporate potential move-ins to our area might want for a short term. And of course, this is a 30-year plan and we're gonna be post-COVID pretty darn soon. So I was hoping we could flush that out a little more than the, the question that arrived. Uh, Evidently, there were no questions posed about economic development. But I, I do think that the plan should incorporate a good deal more economic development in it than it, it currently has. But uh, I have to say to staff, you did an outstanding job with this. This is a very well written, uh, very well flushed out plan. I just don't want to see us not giving enough weight to the corporate sector as we arrive at the last 5% of our growth in the city. Look, Plano's well known for a robust economic uh, development uh, team, and uh, we have talked about that. I don't know if we want to have some others speak to that or not. Uh, Certainly. Are there specific um, questions that you have regarding the economic development? Are there, I guess, staff, I think we need more direction from the commission as far as what it is you would like to see from us. If, if 
there's more information on economic development you'd like to see in the plan, we would like to hear some more specific direction from the commission as to what, what you'd like that to look like. Or if there's specific questions that are, that we'd like to have responses from the economic development staff, um, we're open to passing along those questions. I'll get no questions. Well, I, I, we did not get questions. I don't want to throw out uh, for you, Christine. It's not the only one that is of importance, I think, but <clears throat> this quote in, in the uh, draft plan document, it says, although uh, uh, it's about evolving trends in office, uh, much of the legacy area employment center was developed with large corporate campuses. Although these provide desirable open space and urban tree canopy, these sprawling office complexes are often isolated from supporting restaurants, entertainment, service uses, and transit connections that many large businesses are seeking in today's office environment. Um, how valid that statement is, is in my mind um, a good deal questionable. There are a lot of companies that are financial companies that have security concerns that need drive up on security uh, and, and a higher level of security than we've ever seen before. Uh, companies are moving out of the New York City area because of a lack of ability to properly secure their facilities. When we think about what the next 30 years are going to look like, the legacy area, and, and I drove through uh, only on Sunday uh, and saw an awful lot of open land that I didn't really realize was there and, and buildings have been vacated. What is the future of the city for attracting the very large corporate employers, either regional offices or headquarters offices, that will afford them enough security and not actually pander to the idea that people should be walking their dogs on their front lawns? Because a lot of the plan calls for walkable environments in corporate centers. And I don't know what portion of today's corporations that are moving from other parts of the country really want that versus an office park. So that's specific um, that came to mind about it. And it's probably more of a question for uh, Ms. Bain, Ms. Bain's office to give an assessment of uh, what companies are asking for. <clears throat> because I, I don't doubt if you ask the average CEO who's never going to walk out of his office to a restaurant, he, he might go to his country club, but he, he's not walking to his subway from his office, but he'll say, sure, we want Subway down on our front lawn. But that may not exactly be what we need for our city as we go forward. And this, the second question I can pose to you from a specific standpoint is where do we fit in vis-a-vis -vis Frisco and, Mc, and uh, McKinney who have an abundance of, of, of excess space and we don't? And what are we going to do to conserve the space we have for corporate economic development going forward, especially in the places that adjoin those two other entities that are aggressive in seeking out-of-town employers? PGA is going to be a great asset to play to a Frisco, building two golf courses. We couldn't handle two golf courses with our density, but um, we sure could. We sure could handle 5,000 Schwab workers who are moving to Northern California and instead are going out north of Fort Worth. So those are questions that, you know, I'm all over when I think about 30 years, the next 30 years here in Moino. Know. Where do we fit in versus Frisco and McKinney? Yeah, okay, competitive, competitively. We should add Allen to that. <clears throat> Allen, that's, and Allen too, that's right. All that land on the south side of 121 is available. And then how does the plan, how do we ensure that our plan's competitive with our peer surrounding communities? That's correct. You know, w once we throw this into the public forum of the city council, they're going to say, we love our neighbors, we get along with our neighbors, they're going to they're make their stock statements. But in the end, we're going to be in competition with uh, particularly Frisco and McKinney on the 121 corridor and on the 75 corridor, uh, as Commissioner Gibbons points out, with Allen. And, and we're it's actually to... Allen on the south side of 121, McKinney on the north side of 121. That's right. Uh, the only thing I can add is uh, economic development is not my area of specialty particularly, but I can tell you what I'm hearing from other cities that we're, we're working in. 
uh, is that uh, I think there's a lot of people that if you if you ask them, uh, they might admit to you that they're not sure where the office environment's going right now. Uh, we're like our our company. Uh, we're uh, trying to develop a policy on w how to come back and, and after after the pandemic. And I agree with you. I'm hoping we're rounding the corner on that. But uh, there's still a lot of people that want to work from home, and it's it's all across all industries. And so uh, there's going to be a lot of office space out there, I think. And a lot of employers are trying to figure out uh, how to deal with this. Amazon, they'll let people work anywhere they want. And so is that the way of the future? And so uh, there's other industries that are trying to figure out the same thing. So it's, it's a real difficult, uh, it's, it's difficult right now to really frame this office environment what I hear. Uh, this is what I'm being told. Right. Um, you're absolutely right. As a matter of fact, there was just an article I read, I don't remember which publication, and it talked about the recruiting. Um, we're a job center as much as anything else. I know there's 150 some odd thousand people that have a job <coughs> we're a job center. And we have a very highly educated one. Those corporations that exist and operate here in Plano who want to retain that workforce, they're now competing with out of town employers who are saying, You can live in Plano, we don't care, you can work from there, we'll pay you a little more because we don't have to house you, we don't have to do anything else. So you're right, the, the job environment's changing. My question, I understand what you're, you're saying, Commissioner Samara, but I would just ask Steph, is our plan, the way it's written right now, uninviting or in some way, shape, or form, uh, dissuading corporations to move here? If the answer is no, and it's really not this body's job to try to create an incentive, that's economic development and council. That's not really our role. But the question is valid, but that's where I would lean the staff and say, is there anything in our plan document that would prevent corporations from moving here? We can't add the amount of land we have available. As long as our code and our, our uh, designations for the different zones doesn't dissuade them from moving here. It's not really our job to try to incentivize them to build here. But in your in that comment, when you say staff, are you talking about planning and zoning staff, yep. or are you talking about Charlie Bain? No, I'm talking about planning and zoning staff. The staff feel like our plan is welcoming and inviting to corporations. Is the staff qualified to answer the question? I, I would I would well, agree with well, that. We, we didn't really make any wholesale changes to a lot of that area out there all that, that wasn't the that wasn't the direction from council to cprc was to deal with the corporate business side yes sir so that's why i'm saying is there anything about this plan that would do that and to your point about the staff qualifies when it comes to a comprehensive plan these guys built the number one plan in the country i'm going to trust them all day long on the, incent on the incentivization or incentivizing a company to come here, uh, that's Sally and, and her group. And I mean, I know Sally well, and she's obviously done a tremendous job over the years getting people here. But that would, that would be my response to his question is, is there anything in our plan that would dissuade a corporation from coming here? I'll tell you my perspective on our kind of land use model and how it relates to economic development. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of pressure since Plano has largely run out of residential land. Um, we have seen pressure for years for residential development because there's opportunities, a lot more opportunities to build commercial property than residential property. You guys see that on every agenda, right? <laughs> um, so what we've done very intentionally um, in our plan is try to protect land for commercial development because we know um, the pressure side, the pressure, although we only have 5% of land remaining from a vacancy perspective citywide, the vast majority of that is commercially zoned. So the pressure is always on the residential side. Um, so what we've got to do, the pushback we've got to have is 
towards that residential development side of things. So we've got it. The, the question is always where is it appropriate to rezone commercial property for residential development? What are the city's priorities in that regard? Um, is it appropriate to rezone? And if so, where? So that's the question I think our land use plan has to answer. And if it's doing that appropriately, then we're doing the right thing. Um, but what we've done very strategically, I think, in, uh, is protect our business parks. Um, now, I think a long Personally, time. Yes, yes. And I think that <clears throat> that's the employment center category. It says very explicitly residential development's not allowed. We've had many, many asks. Eric will tell you how many times we've bought off. The amount of times the R&D has come in, somebody's tried to come in and put homes on right. the edge of the R&D, and every right. time we've shot it down. Every time. Obviously, everybody remembers J.C. Penney, and we saw it two different ways, and we denied you know, both those ways because they weren't you know, appropriate. My thoughts, not to bump in, Christina, though, but yes. to keep us yep. focused where we need to be, is in looking at you know what our task is, is looking at the changes that the CPRC has made and what we, you know, or good with what we might want to alter or whatnot, um, and that's not an area that was really discussed much. And I look back and on the land use and community design, the undeveloped land section is pretty clear about saving land for uh, employment type development, and then also the economic environment section, which had maybe a couple of sentences changed or just yeah. nothing of an essence uh, on the economic environment, which talks about. Uh, our workforce and new new businesses and whatnot. I think those are covered. Um, I don't think there was a lot, if any, change. You know, many, there's not a lot of many changes coming from the CPRC. So I want to keep us focused on what our charge is, is not to rewrite the plan. Right. These guys have spent a year of their time doing that, and we need to look at what they've done and bless what we can and send back what we can, rather than starting from scratch. So. I understand Commissioner Samara's concerns, and I do think that economic development is a big part of this, but I also think that it speaks to it. There's sections on here that speak to that, and knowing I don't see anything here that's going to make an employer or a corporation that's wanting to, to relocate say, oh, gosh, look at that plan. We can't do this here. I think it's the opposite. I still think uh, that we're uh, one of the top areas in the nation, for sure in the state, but in the nation of, um, for this movement. And I'm excited to see what the market will bear out with the J.C. Penney uh, campus because I think something big can happen there. So I do I do get your concerns. I think some of them are here. They're broad and they're general, but that's what we had passed before. That's what they left alone and probably want to keep it that way for now. This day is right. We, from the, from our, the people that we work with, we, we hire a lot of subs to do this kind of work. But across the Metroplex, uh, Plano's not unique to this predicament right now. What we're hearing is, is if you have uh, land that's, uh, that has entitlements for multiple families, across the Metroplex, it's not just Plano, that you can pretty much write your own, that's how much in demand it is. Entitles means it's pretty, pretty well zoned or designated for uh, high density residential. You can pretty much ask whatever you want to ask for pricing. And it's like that across the Metroplex right now. That, that's It's just housing's that way across the Metroplex, not just Plano. So. One thing I would say, and I, I didn't mean any disrespect to the staff, I'm just saying, given Commissioner Smara's comment, it seems like Kelly Bain's office would be better suited to answering the question of what do corporations want. So I think the, the, the better way to do this, instead of trying to get them to come here and make us a presentation, is to take the plan and let us know if they have any concerns. Kind of just coming out of the opposite direction is all. Um, I guess the thing about the plan overall that kind of was a little more concerning to me is that it felt like the CPRC was trying to impose future actions of both the PNZ and city council by putting in voting standards and, you know, if this happens, they have to reach this kind of goal to get there. And I don't know, it just felt like they were really trying to tie hands. Uh, future group, and I'll say this, but I don't want to get out of turn, but we are going to have a, a future, and when I say future, probably the next meeting, right? right. Executive session with council over right. some legal concerns regarding right. some issues that are within that, um, the plan tonight, the supermajority and the limiting 
uh, developments to certain areas in the city. So I don't want us to get ahead of ourselves on those areas because I know that they're going to be hotly, de you know, hotly debated. But let's get legal uh, discussion with us before we spend too much time talking about those because that may it may um, influence our decision, if you will. I'm not getting, hopefully, not getting the city sued and, and whatnot, not violating the city charter. But I don't want to get ahead of ourselves on that. This is our chance to speak up. All right. All right. Um, before we get into the, really the nut of this plan, I'm kind of looked at it from several perspectives, but also trying to look at it from a citizen's perspective, but also mm -hmm. from boards and commissions. We got this plan done in front of us, and what I don't see in this plan, as I've seen in other plans, is what's the purpose of this plan? That's one. Two, how do you use this plan? How do we use it? How does the city council use it? How do board and commissions use it? How do citizens use it? There's none of that instruction. So when we throw this to a citizen, they're going to say, where are my avenues on, if we have a zoning case, here's the guidance on zoning. How do I now go to voice my concern, if you will, to PNC and or the city council? We don't have that. Those brief introductions in this. Now, you may have, I tried to find it on the website, and it wasn't on the website. And I know that's probably what well. The, the staff uses this on a daily basis. This this plan is more specific than your last one. Your last one was general, mm -hmm. and this add the word we came up with was add more specific specificity in the direction that that staff needs to take when they review this development, especially in terms of density and land use. And I don't think. We've changed any of that. We've always, the, st the staff has always used it, and so I don't think that, if anything, it's going to provide them more specific guidance than, than and, and I don't think we've changed anything in the way they looked at development review against the proposed plan. But well, what so, I'm I mean, getting at is, it's like, we have an introduction, the purpose of the plan, this is what the plan is, guidance, guidance on how we're going to go here. But say parks and recreation, and they want to update their master plan. Say, or they're going to have new part or something. They have to refer back to this plan. Environmental health has to refer back to this plan. We have to refer back to that. There's always back and forth between the various departments within the city on how to be compliant with this plan. There should be a, a snippet, if you will, a paragraph in there okay. to cover that. Same with city council. This is, you know, because everything that we go through city council, this is what where we came back from our recommendation or another board or commission came back with their recommendation. We follow the plan. And the citizens, you know, we, we live this. We've been through several iterations. The, the uh, review committee has spent a whole year on it. They're instantly involved with it. But the citizens, when we have our public meeting, they're going to see this plan. They're going to try to say, where do we fit in? How do I use this plan? I think there's something to be said about having that type of first two pages, you know. Certainly don't make it drawn out, but use it as a map to voice a concern about particular development or change in a park or something. I just think that there's something at the very beginning, before we get into the nut and the details, there's, there's something to be in there like instructions okay. on how to use it. I, I would say just quickly that, just so this plan is still intended to be a web-based plan. So I know we gave out a paper document because that's what it was working with. But our, our intent is that the, the public goes to the website, not, not going through a 100-page PDF. So we've tried to translate everything in here and give it more context on the website. And one of those pages is, I don't know if we can bring it up, Christina, but it does have uh, kind of some overview about what comprehensive plans are and how they're used. Now, we could probably we could probably build on that and make it a little more <laughs> engaging if you like, but we do have it under, you know, I think it's right, what is the comprehensive plan? Yeah, we have this. We've got generic, what is the comprehensive plan? But then if you scroll down, um, it's, it's actually the about the plan page. It talks about the history. Here. About the draft plan page here. It's got to scroll down, you'll see uh, how it's used, delivery of city services, capital and budget planning, and then development review conformance. So looking at it in zoning cases. Yeah. So we can build on that. I think this would be the avenue to do that. And I, I recognize it was on the web base. We're looking at the paper. Oh, okay. kind of, so that, that, that's that's the point of your, your, your comments, is right. that we should try to make sure that that's at least mentioned in the, in the, in the paper. Right. Part that's going to be part of the ordinance, the adopting right. ordinance. Yeah. And okay. I think the citizens, when we have our public meeting, there's going to be questions on, the, on that. Right. How do I use this document? Okay. And just really quick.
quickly, I think, I think it's important to notice that what, what's in the paper document is kind of the strategic framework. So this is what goes in the ordinance. It requires council to amend what's in the ordinance. But the stuff that's more um, kind of friendly language, plain language, that, that lives in the web plan is not necessarily part of the approved document ordinance. Right. And that gives us flexibility to, as procedures change, as you know, trends change, we can go in there and, and, and continue to keep this, this site evolving and engaging uh, without having to go to council to, to approve those amendments every single time. Right. So we'll try to keep as much of that. It'd be our, our, our hope to leave as much of that in the website um, and not in this strategic framework paper copy. Okay. The goal is just to have that really be the policy document, essentially, with the ordinance. Mm -hmm. Could I just say one thing to also speak to your question is the, um, the public was very intentionally thought about when we were working with the executive summary, especially uh, the introductory pages on uh, how will the plan be used. And uh, that was also part of the delivery of a lot of the language and the glossary to make sure that everyday people, we found on the CPRC that um, the members that were appointed didn't all have the same working knowledge as you guys do as it relates to planning and zoning. And so uh, the staff worked very hard uh, to bring the language into a level that the everyday citizen would understand and uh, would be able to translate into what does this mean and how do I use it. Right. The was a great addition. I don't want to let the, not that I'm taking the chairman's job here, but I don't want to let the time get away from, no. from us here. Are there any other specific, you know, as you get into it, uh, are there things that you have specific questions about that we haven't already answered? Is there anything that we need to talk about amongst the group? It's our chance, and we don't want to miss that chance. If, if. For me, the, the two areas, the biggest areas of concern are the two areas that the premature we talked about, about the majority requirement and eliminating new development um, in certain, only in certain sections of the city. I've got a lot of beliefs and opinions about that, but I don't want to get them, you know, all out until we know what legal is going to tell us about that. But, but we my can reserve that until next Yeah, but next my concern that kind of covers that area is something that I mentioned before is uh, I feel like some of it is too restrictive, specific. Uh, it's a comprehensive plan is a vision. It's a guide. And as I've preached for years since the, the, the issues have started with the plan, there is nothing in the plan, the, the 86 plan that we used before, plan on tomorrow, there's nothing in plan on tomorrow that tells this commission and then to the city council how they have to vote on anything. It is something that we look at. It is something that guides us in our decision making, but it is not something that controls our decision making. And that's got to come out of this because that's not what the charge was to the committee was to change city policy and to change how uh, how we vote and how we're guided. The majority of the stuff that I, I felt that I've studied is this is really impressive and it explains in a lot greater detail than we ever had with land use and with density and the key issues that everybody knows are really the issues, the definitions, the calculations, the building heights. That's all awesome stuff and went way beyond, what, honestly, what I thought would, would, would come out of, it, out of the committee. But I just can't personally swallow the concept that this document controls the vote that I make. Because I look at everything. I don't just look at the comprehensive plan. I look at the neighborhood, what the neighbors say. I look at the piece of land. I look at my 49-year history of living in the city of Plano. Does that belong there, or does that not belong there? What's the land use? And more importantly, what's the economic situation of that time versus when this thing was written, because now we know that the economic realities are a lot different than just a few years ago. Look at what we did with uh, the Billingsley property over by Sam's at Coit. We used all that retail uh, and now in all that office, and now the way, you know, because of COVID and whatnot, there's not that much demand for retail. We don't need first floor retail on all these, all these buildings because we just watch them sit empty or somebody go in and go out of business six months later. So I, I just, I, I'm not comfortable with the document, the plan, the, the website telling the commission and then the city council how they must vote and in what numbers they must vote. And I know, you know, I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's my, my biggest concern. So, you know, when we uh, talked about this at the last meeting, I, 
think I expressed some concern possibly about it being a bit restrictive, but it might be helpful. Can you represent um, possibly the people that felt it was important to have this super majority and specifically why they asked for that? Because, you know, I, I think maybe there's a lot of people in here that feel uh, similar to you, but there's a number of people on that committee, I think, that feel this super majority is, is important. And so maybe if you could help us understand really what they were driving at there to let me make, you put that in the plan. Let, let me, me make an help. opening comment and then uh, maybe Mr. Ronsky can supplement it. But I think the intent was is that we wanted a high bar. We wanted to make sure that the plan, uh, as it was stated and as it was uh, included within the plan, we wanted a high bar for change. We're, we're follow, we're, we mean we're serious about this. We want to follow it. And to change it is fine, but we want a very high standard for that and make sure that it's well vetted in that. I don't know if that sets up for sure. further for the further comments by you, Mike. Absolutely. Um, so the um, everything that is before you is uh, a result of uh, basically, as I said before, about 600 hours of the subcommittees negotiating. There were give and take opportunities uh, amongst the four subcommittee members, and um, some of the areas that you're mentioning, uh, Chairman Barbera, the you said that it is uh, guiding decision making. Well, the, the two items that you're referencing, um, there were a couple rationales why room was given for those and a 15 to zero vote of the committee as a whole uh, passed it. Uh, as Dan spoke already, it was definitely about a high bar. There were two other things that uh, were very important to the subcommittee as well as the committee of, as a whole that these items were included. Uh, number one is we wanted to guide the city council that we wanted more unity. We wanted them working together and uh, less fighting. The second piece was we wanted to ensure that whenever uh, a balance on city council changes, that we don't see, that we give more stability to the residents as well as to the people that are looking to move to Plano, both residents and businesses, more stability and confidence that we are going to, we are going to stay stable and stay representative of what we've been saying we want. So those are really the, the keys that are there. The high bar, the unity, the less change, and uh, guiding direction as far as um, what, what decision-making. It was never intended to be uh, controlling how you vote, but more guiding what we'd like to see uh, from your votes. Yeah, I understand the, all of the rationale that we've mentioned. What I don't, what I can't get around is the, the way that it's pulled off. And by dictating a vote and red light, green light, yellow light, document can't tell me what I have to do because that's I was appointed to look at everything and not just the plan but to listen to the neighbors to look at the history to look at the situation at the time and not when the thing was written three or four years ago down the road so that's my biggest concern out of the whole thing is, is the thought that I it dictates what I do as a commissioner and I don't think any of you guys should feel that way but that's it's just one opinion on one of eight. So I think that this potential issue is, is what we're going to be discussing in the executive session because right. of the potential for legal. I tend to be a little, a little more in line with the chairman. I am also, every project stands on its own. And in the past, I voted against staff recommendations to deny, and I voted against staff recommendations to approve because I should be open, right? I use the plan as a guide, but not as a dictate. Uh, that if you're going to go that direction, why do you need us, 
right? You don't need a planning and zoning commission. You just go to council. But state law actually, I think, requires us to have a planning and zoning commission, and they should have a particular charge, which is to evaluate projects that are presented for them. The other thing is the you're going to require a supermajority on a project because it uh, doesn't, again, fall directly in line with either a staff recommendation to approve or a PMZ recommendation to approve or something else. Well, where do you draw the line? What other decisions made by council should get to be supermajority? For the exact same reasons you talk about, stability and everything else, valid reasons, but that's not really the way government is supposed to work. If the citizens do not agree with the decisions being made by council, they elect different council members. They don't change the policies to say, well, you've got to elect more than a certain number in order to be able to do that. So I think we're going to get legal guidance on it, and then I make my mind may change. But I do appreciate the thought behind why you might need it. Uh, I'm just not sure that I necessarily agree with it. I'd be looking to the conversation in executive session. And um, the document itself, honestly, <laughs> let's say we approve it, 15 0, we approve it, it goes to council, they approve it. And two years from now, a different council, a different PNZ, a different planning staff rewrites it, and mm -hmm. we're gone, and it doesn't matter anymore, right? So we put a ton of effort into this, put a ton of effort into the first one. Um, I'm interested in hearing the legal side of some of the requirements of the plan. If legal says there's no reason you can't do that, then I think we have a basis for a discussion on whether we approve it or not. But um, again, that there's something that came out of it, staff has even said, the, the, this plan is stronger in many ways than the plan on tomorrow. And to your point, the more transparent it becomes to a citizen who goes to the website and wants to understand what's the zoning on this corner over here, how do I understand what they could put there? Because I, I, I don't know, if you sat on the commission very long, you've got people that approach you and said, how do I find out how this is zoned? And wouldn't it be great if you could just simply say, if you go to the website, there's a check here, check here, check here, check here. Just follow the little tree, decision tree, and you will find the zoning for that property and a clear description of what you can build there. So, just a, rem a reminder, I know probably every, the supermajority com. Component of that applies to the city council, not to you all. Understood. I, we, to just, 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 yeah. just to remind. Well, that's why I talk yeah. about yeah. being an election. You get to elect people to council for that reason. We already have a supermajority requirement, right? If it gets denied by PNC. It requires a supermajority on council, right? So, okay, there's some track record there. Uh, if more than a certain number of people vote against it or, or speak out against it, mm -hmm. it requires a supermajority. So we already have that in place. Why do we have to keep go even further? Well, as, as I mentioned, um, the, the 15 to 0 vote that we had on the CPRC, uh, we, I was very intentional as I worked with Chairman Shockey in choosing who was on the subcommittee. And uh, as you all know, uh, Mr. Hilton Kong was one of the subcommittee members. And we had, not to the level that I'm sure you're having, but we did have discussions with this and about this topic. And uh, Mr. Kong did agree that uh, with the give and take on other issues that this be put in here, and uh, he voted for it as well. Okay. Well, yeah, obviously, because it wouldn't have got here. Correct. You know, and, and it might be an issue, once we had our discussion, that we just don't agree on. And we Could can be. let council know, hey, we are good with 98% of this, but here are the two things that we can pull. And then... It's ultimately their decision, and not ours. It's going to be their decision. Uh, so I don't. I understand what what you're saying, and that we may not get the support of, enough of the support of the committee to make it go through. Well, then, that, then so be it. We've got the line in the sand, and then we'll take. We'll give it to the to the group of us to make the ultimate decision. It was my understanding, right? That, well, no. If it doesn't pass P and Z, then it's supposed to go back to CPU. Right. Any change that we, if I'm right, any change that we don't accept, right. uh, or any change that we make from what yeah, they've done, it goes back to the commission okay. theoretically for another vote, yep. um, and then back to us. And then when we have something that's all agreed on, then it goes to council. I've been seeing how this has gone with the subcommittees and, and everything. I, 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 
from what I'm hearing from every you know from everybody that I've spoken to is that it, it, it may not happen. We may not get a full document that we everybody can agree on. Can, that Seventy-five percent of the, of the committee can mm -hmm. agree on, and that the majority of this commission can agree on. And if that's the case, so be it. But let's let's approve what you know okay. what we can agree on, which is the vast majority of it, in my opinion. I mean, one one of my favorite things, Mike, but I'm so glad you guys did for years. I've been hounding the staff. We need to define a high rise versus a mid rise because we don't have a definition of how many floors is which. And now that I look around Plano and I've seen 30 foot buildings with condos and apartments, and we still don't have a definition of what's a high rise versus a mid rise. So I was tickled that that's finally, we finally have that, that in here because I think that makes a big difference because we're going to see more and more projects where people are going up instead of out. And that was um, uh, committee member Jim Delaboot provided that detail. Yeah. So no, that that that's that's like I said, that's actually one of my favorite parts of what y'all done is it gives us a definition of what these building types are that we didn't have and that I've for years have been. We did spend a lot of time with definitions and, and educational. There there were there were commit. Uh, you all are used to reviewing development review every two weeks. Well, some members on the committee weren't. It never done that before, and so we tried to provide an appropriate level of education and documentation, and so we did spend a lot of time on that. I think it's one of the reasons the plan has become stronger is because you yeah. had to develop something that people who were completely unfamiliar with planning could understand. It, it didn't hurt us to, uh, you know, expose ourselves to somebody that hasn't had your background of a, a bi-weekly review, of development review. They're... Uh, lay citizens, most of them, and they uh, appreciated the education, we think. It's much more visual plan, which I think is really useful. Now, I think everybody on the committee here would probably endorse the, the, the reasons. It's just the question of how do we get there. We've got some quiet commissioners over here. What do you guys think? I can, I can tell you I'm very pleased with the website. I'm pleased with the executive summary. I think everything that that comes out of the city that's this complex ought to have an executive summary every time. I'm pleased with the here's what's changed, here's what's not changed, and and the verbiage is not is not particularly uh, P and Z level. It's shirt sleeve English where the average housewife, the average guy who goes to work every day can understand what the comprehensive plan is trying to do. And if he has some questions, there's answers in there, there's contacts that where you can get more information. I, I really like the website. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think the, the largest thing I've struggled with is, so we have this, how do you execute this? Where, where does this really take us? I mean, is it, like we've talked about, is this just something to guide us? Is it what we can move with any way we want? Or, you know? Well, it's like any, any case that you have now. It, 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 in our business, traditionally plans have been, and you've used the words a couple already, a guide. That, that's what these plans are supposed to be, is a guide. Now, here's the deal. We, we do the best we can at creating a plan, and it's a static document. Cities aren't static. They're dynamic. They're changing all the time. Once we adopt this plan for Plano, there's going to be something else that is different that we're going to have to deal with. I'm going to be obsolete in six months. You, you know, so, but that's why, that's why you review plans, and that's why you keep them updated. Plano has had a great history of doing that. So the idea is, to answer the question specifically, is this is supposed to be a guide you to make your decisions. There's other things that it doesn't provide you when you look at a zoning case. Okay? I mean, when you look at a zoning case, you're looking at a very, you're, you're looking at ingress, egress, you're looking at topography, you're looking at all, the configuration of the property. All these things cannot be addressed in the comprehensive plan. So the comprehensive plan needs to provide this overall guide, this overall direction of policy and where you want to go and then it's up to you like you're saying you don't, you don't need a P and Z it's up to you to interpret how that specific zoning case is consistent 
or complies with the comprehensive plan. That's your job. And you can look at it in a number of ways, but that's what you do. That's what, that's what you do now. The plan provides more specificity in a lot of things, particularly density and location of where it goes. Yes, it does do that. Chair, can I speak for just a minute to the, I'm hearing a lot of language about guide and, and specificity and um, I, I just want to remind everyone, there is a statute out there that says that the, the zoning decisions have to comply with the comprehensive plan. And that's, that's the baseline, we've got that in the statute. So what turns something so that it's less like a guide and, and more like tying hands is the specificity of the language. The more specific the language is, the more it's, it's easy to tell that it complies or doesn't comply with the plan when the application comes in. But even with specific language, you're going to be weighing competing goals that are stated in the plan. So um, if, if your goals in the plan are very harmonious, that ties your hands more than if your goals are broad and kind of can cross past each other. Like, like if you say, um, we're very interested in, in lots of economic development, we want a super vibrant community. And then you say something, but we really want to preserve the suburban character. Well, those goals can really contradict each other at times, right? So that's where your planning and zoning commission is going to be weighing what's most important in any situation and, and playing a role in making those decisions. So, you know, your hands are less tied then. So I, I just want to make sure that everybody recognizes that, that compliance with the plan is, a, is just the basics that the statute requires. And, and when, but when I hear we really like the specificity but we don't want our hands tied, I think, okay, we really need to think this through a little bit because the more specific we are, the more we're tied, and then we have to explain if we're not going to follow that specific thing in the plan, we have to explain why a different policy is more important in particular circumstances. And I, I think this group is sophisticated and can do that, but, but that's kind of what you're talking about. So, to exactly what Michelle mentioned, uh, that was one of the things the CPRC asked the city to work on. We felt like some of the conflict that was going on in our community was because the goals were not more harmonious, more together. And so we asked staff to look at the plan to try to uh, bring things together and bring things in harmony rather than things being in competition with one another. So are you guys comfortable with where we are now until we hear um, from our executive session and then move forward after that. Was there anything else that you guys want to dig into this evening? We've well, got time. I actually got one, and it, and it scares me more than anything, is when we look at transit-oriented or development. And my biggest fear with our metros and silver lines that we have here is what you've seen in Chicago, New York, and even D.C. with the metro area, is that you see in the transit station and you see in blight develop around the transit stations. We got really not darts great. The solar line is going to be terrific. We're passing close zoning on that. I'm just wondering if this is the right document that we need to, 20 years down the line, 30 years down the line, do we need to add another TOD6, if you will, to ensure that this blight at the transit station does not occur. Uh, that's my biggest fear about having these, these stations because they're all nice and shiny when they're developed. Even DC's Metro was. And they've you know, gone to Metro, they're going through a major renovation right now at the cost of billions of dollars. But you saw that at the at station. And I'm just wondering if that's something we need to address here or is this even the right forum to address that? I don't know. Do we know what the cause of that blight is? Well, I. You know, it's just neighborhoods going down, you know, businesses change. I mean, 
Chicago and New York is just age, age of the infrastructure is really what it was, and the surrounding community buildings around it, that aging out, if you will, the business section downtown. We're lucky we got, you know, uh, the uh, station there at downtown. It's great, right? But if you look at those apartments back there, exterior-wise, they look okay, but interior-wise, they're, they're aging out. They're getting old. And I'm just concerned that we're going to see something like that. And I'm, I'm just wondering if this is the right avenue that we address that specific point. Or do we leave that to code enforcement? Or, I don't know. Well, you're, you're right about Washington, D.C. Uh, Henry Weiss uh, won an award for those that domed mm -hmm. concept that they have there. And I remember when it opened, it was beautiful. But it's shown its age. And so I, I think that the, the only thing that we can do to guard against that is diligently look at your plan periodically, every five years or whatever. We, you know, the farther out we go, the less good, less better we are. It's just hard to look out that far and say, here's what we're going to need to guard against this. Make our best, best recommendations mm -hmm. now and then periodically look at these. And if we need to take a more detailed look, we try to put that in there from time to time, too. Well, this it's on, it's 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 itself, is, you know. is this the time frame? We said we were going to look at you. You haven't pulled any for those of you every two years. But I'm, I'm, I'm bringing a point now. We add that TD... TOD6 now so that as an action the city looks at it, just to say, okay, how are we doing on our stations? I, I don't know. I, I, it's just, that's my biggest fear with have, having a, a metro station. Commissioner Horn, I, I, I'm with you. Question 13 and the answers that the, that the staff got back to us on is if it's not a question I ask, it's very similar to a question I asked. And the answer was can we put that in the plan right now to forestall some of the things you're talking about. And the answer the staff got back was yes. And I, so I'm with you. I, I think however we can do that thoughtfully to try to get in front of that right now, I think would be wise because um, ultimately some of those things seem to be a natural evolution. And I'm sure there's some best practices and other things that could be looked at to try to get in front of it even before there starts to become a problem. You know, and unfortunately too, part of the challenge is that none of us have a crystal ball. That's right. And we don't know what's going to happen with the new DART stations that have been approved. We don't know what they're going to look like in five years. We don't. We're going to do everything we can do to keep them looking the way they need to and the amenities around them being the way they are, but we just don't know. And that's why a plan that gives us guidance is helpful. <coughs> but uh, going back to the, how precise do you need it to be, is we just don't know. And, and um, I don't know that that's – if we threw something in the transit – Developments now that's not already there, we need to take a pretty hard look at. Well, again, this is the, the opportunity I'm bringing up in front of us right now to have a discussion. I mean, look what's happening on the Silver Line. You got on Avenue K, you got the apartment complex just being built with the sky bridges across it. That's a good looking, that's a good looking complex right now. You know, we're just hoping in 30 years it's still. Well, um, but we don't know that, but you know what I mean. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. Honestly, it'll probably be a case of in 30 years, it's going to be 30 years old, and it's going to have had how many thousands of people living in it, and they're all going to have left their mark. And you have owners that will maintain the property, and you can look for ways to incentivize them too, but ultimately what will probably have to happen is somebody will come in and redevelop it and say, I want to double the number of units. And the city has to have the courage to say, we're willing to accept that in, in exchange for a brand new facility. Because until it gets to a point to where it's more valuable to, it, it has to be worth the money that a developer is going to put into it. But, but We've said a, no. Isn't that a, dis, a decision or an issue we have with every piece of property? It yeah, absolutely I mean, is. Not and necessarily we've, transit oriented. And sure. we've already said no to some places where I think we should have been encouraged to say yes, because it would have given the city a new property, a new, more valuable place that is maintained, that does look nice. Uh, and we've said no to a couple of them recently, and I even said no to one. And so, you know, if we, we'll see what happens with that. But I don't think you can be able to legislate what happens 30 years from now. Legislate's the wrong word in this current plan. Okay. But as a guy, but as a guy, <laughs> I, I still think as a guy, as a bullet, I'm using the wrong terminology. As, as, a, as a bullet item, I think it's something that, that to, uh, 
So the plan our station our station stay. Well, but that's up to Dart. I mean, I guess I'm not. But that's sure. a partnership. We're paying half a cent to Dart. True. That right. True. Okay. So but that's under a different body than this. So I, I guess all I'm trying to figure out is is it the issue of maintaining the, the, the station itself or the stuff around the station? And how is if it's around the station? How is that different than any other piece of property? Yeah, I guess I, that's where I'm that's getting at. Concern. That's why I said does it go back to code? Yeah. You know, I don't know. I mean, I, I like what the idea. I just don't know how. To yeah, I, I don't that. know how do we put that in there to, to protect ourselves, to protect the future generations to still have a, You know, the trains are going to change, no doubt. You know, there'll be magnet trains by then or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, we'll all have that, our own personal transports. I guess. <laughs> I guess. But my point being, the area around it, I just don't want to see that blight. You know, that, that worn out look. That all of a sudden, you know, it starts and it just. So I, would I would suggest, excuse me a second, sorry. But, so I think there's some things that are clearly true, obviously true. We don't know what's going to happen in 30 years. But we do know where we are now, and I think we could use some wisdom to make the best decisions we have now in anticipation of 30 years, knowing that it might need to, to change. And I, I, for one, would hate to not do some things that might be beneficial when we have the ability to do it now, using the wisdom we have and knowing that 30 years from now we don't know what we have to encounter. And so... I, I, again, I'm with Commissioner Horn. I'm, I'm with them on that. I think it would be wise to do it. That's what this plan does is that uh, we put the best wisdom, collective wisdom. I used to tell, I still tell cities this, is that uh, the plan says what Plano aspires right now. This is what we think is best for Plano. This is our vision. This is what. Now, if, if you have a different idea, you need to come in and explain to us and to us is really staff and you all and council. But you need to come in and explain why your idea is better than our idea. And it, it puts you more on the offense rather than always on the defense because developers take advantage of that. So what you're saying is our comprehensive 21 plan for Plano is our best wisdom today. This is, we're not that good that we can go out 30 years. And so if you want to do something different, you can come in and propose something different. High bar, we want to make sure it's better. We want your idea to be better than what we have in our plan. And that's the way it works. And then you all judge that. You, you all provide your wisdom on that to see if you want to make that change. That's the way it works. I think Commissioner Horn's question is a good one. Is, is this the appropriate place? I think it, it can be. It certainly can. But I'd also point your attention to TOD2, which is about developing station area plans. And that's getting into that next level down from the comp plan, like Oak Point did. And looking at those plans specifically at the retail market, at the ridership, at the land and the zoning around it, where do the, what will the market support? Um, that could also be the stage where those questions are answered. The only other, I would have one comment for you as well. And the redevelopments that you're talking about, like Chicago and New York and so forth, RGM 6 and 7 both uh, were our attempt to reflect on those. Um, in making sure that we're looking at what the demand is, making sure that we're reviewing the comp plan on a regular basis, making sure things are being adjusted and amended as they need to be uh, as wisdom changes. A good example would be we tend to shy away from developers whose process is to build something and then sell it. We like owner development where they're going to own them, develop them, and continue to manage them. That's something that we do tend to do naturally, at least what I see. It doesn't always work out that way. But I think that's a that's a, that's a good tendency we have. I'm not sure that's documented in the plan in any way, shape, or form, but I know that in my experience here and on council, if a developer comes forward with a plan that's, I'm going to build it and then hand the keys off to somebody, we tend to be a little less favorable of that kind of development. Well, we've been blessed on the office anyway with Rosewood and Billingsley and Granite because those are all that type. That's they're true. Long-term holders, they're not. Right. Well, they're not merchant builders. Right. Build it and sell it. Anything else on that topic? I don't want to switch gears to something different. Guiding principles. I know we've already looked at these, but I've talked to some folks and I said I've talked to a couple of times, and I've thought a little bit more. And Anybody has their big pack, their big packet, but it's it's guiding principle 2.4. The plan acknowledges.
acknowledges that Plano is mostly developed and does not anticipate significant changes in population or development in the future. Can we say that? Because we've had a lot of change in the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, you know, I read one thing uh, during the mm -hmm. campaign meeting. Well, Plano was only developed for this many residents, and I'm like, well, I'm pretty sure we don't have a cap on how many people can live here. So uh, I, I read that language, and I, I'm not as okay with it as I was originally, and wonder if there's a, a better way to address that. Do we even need to say that? No, there's a thought there, too. Because I don't know what's going to happen. Point three is essentially almost the same thing. I, I felt like there was in this there were several redundancies. Yeah, no, sure. I don't agree. It's not, it's, not the same. it's not the same in my opinion. Well, we took a look at two point four. It's mostly developed, but then we look at what's happened with concrete mall. You know. That's a whole new. That's a significant change. That is significant change. What that is. Yeah. And who's to say that in five years from now, and I don't wish this on anybody, but the shops will admit it's having issues. And it's been having issues for years. Uh, so I, I don't know that we can say we don't anticipate significant changes because how can we actually say that? Excited to say you don't anticipate yeah. significant changes. Well, because when this plan, when, when the plan that we're operating on now, when it was written in 1986, Collin Creek Mall was blowing and going and was the most popular mall in North Dallas, and I used to get dropped off there by my parents. It's only eight eight years old. old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and look at it today. And we're, you know, we're back to using that plan, and how can you say that's not a significant change? So I just I don't know if I'm comfortable with that. Line. I think it's an interesting point. I, I think if we look 30 years down the road, we probably can, we probably can anticipate some significant change, quite frankly. Yeah. Now, but I think what this plan is trying to do is is lean into the, the citizens overall feel that they don't want significant change in population you know and, and I, I do think there's a strong group of citizens out there or a large group that feel that way and I think this plan was trying to uh, lean into that a little bit is that accurate or inaccurate we worked very hard to uh, achieve a 15 to 0 uh, passing from the CPRC and we represent Uh, as I was just mentioning, uh, I spent better than three hours in communication via email, telephone, and even in a one-on-one -on -one meeting uh, to Chairman Barbera's point, uh, a young lady who was absolutely adamant that there should be a hard cap at 290,000 people, and if you had a baby and we were at that number, you were going to need to find a new place to live. So I mean, that's not how our country operates. <laughs> uh, well, I did the best I could to explain that that was uh, illegal and uh, just not something we wanted to do. But uh, there are citizens that are very adamant uh, on all sides, and we worked very hard to hear all sides and to find something that everyone could come to agreement with. And that was the negotiation that we went through, both at the subcommittee level as well as the committee as a whole level, to balance all of those into one document that we passed. Here's an example of why that statement, in my opinion, is irresponsible. We are experiencing a significant change in the workforce right now as more and more businesses, because of COVID, realize how effective they can be with their employees working from home and how much less infrastructure they need in real estate and in uh, development. That is a significant change. So how can we say with good conscience that we don't anticipate significant change? I don't say that we should anticipate it. I just don't know that we should say one way or the other yeah, to that effect because we're experiencing it right now. So let me just want to chime in just a bit. Um, we have lawyers in the room right now, and they're used to taking things literally. But I don't see that statement right there as anything but amusing about the overall thrust of the plan. That's an overall statement that we don't anticipate that Plano is going to have significant population changes. Okay, so there's no mandating going on here at all. If we end up topping out at 325,000 instead of 305,000, it the plan itself is not going to mandate any of that. It's simply an assurance to people that this is not an expansive plan, population expansive plan. So I I, I don't know that we should be all that uh, 
twisting around so much about that statement because this statement looks like it's just a general using about the, about the part of the plan, so the direction of the plan. Yeah, but the, the point that does not anticipate significant changes. I mean, look at J.C. Penney campus. Yeah. Okay. That's going to be a significant that's change. That's going to be a significant change as far as it goes. That is part of the, le the legacy development when it first opened is that you had the old great parks. It brought in Frito Lay because of their parks that you address, you know. So, so I, I think that yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually, I agree originally. Why don't we even need it? I wasn't necessarily offended by it so much, but I actually understand now. I think, Commissioner Samara, your point. You know what? It, it makes some people feel comfortable, and it's not a guiding element or it's not a requirement in the plan, but it allows us to get a 15 0 instead of a 14 1 vote. Uh, <laughs> it bothers me that actually one of the people that we have to convince to vote on this thinks that if you have a child and it puts us over 290, no, no, that wasn't, to that wasn't a committee member. Oh, I thought it was a committee member. Oh, my God. It's not a citizen. Ms. Brooks, if that was eradicated, what is your anticipate? What do you guess the vote would be if that's voted for? It's not 14 to 1. So, uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, uh, there was a lot of conversation that was done. Uh, the subcommittee went back and forth. This, uh, as a matter of fact, was, as I presented to you, criteria number two that the subcommittee came to agreement on. And it was the idea that we wanted to emphasize the preserve and enhance aspects of Plano. And that was reflective here. This was, this was we don't expect significant change today. We don't expect, but we expect it to come. We expect change to happen over time. It's, it's, that and that for. But this is under guiding principle, Plano 2050. So I know that it's not today. It's 30 years worth of time, yeah. and I just don't know that that statement's responsible and in, in, in under and saying that Plano 2050. When you're trying to when you're trying to guess what's going to happen. 2030. You, you don't know that. So if they were to move that from 50 to today, would the committee have a problem with that? That's not a half bad idea. If you were to move it, move it yeah, from just slide it over to slide it over to today instead of 50. So I'm not going to guess for the committee, but I'm going to I'm going to say for myself, it probably isn't going to be that big of a deal so long as it stays in there that it's recognized as a guiding principle. More appropriate there than it is. Yeah. In 2050. But if you pulled it out to the question I asked earlier, um, what do you think the vote is? What's your opinion? Well, again, uh, we worked very hard at um, trying to find something that everybody would agree on and that, um, you know, there was a lot of back and forth trading uh, on a lot of different topics. And this is simply uh, trying to pull one thread out of an entire uh, process. And, you know, I frankly, I can't, I can't guess at what, it, what the number would be, but uh, it, it, could have a, it could have an impact, uh, certainly, uh, from listening, uh, some of the other things that you're talking about will have, a, in my opinion, a, a larger impact than this one. But, um, you know, I can't really speak to, you know, each individual committee member's opinion, but this was clearly uh, the, second most, uh, the, sec the second item we addressed as a subcommittee was the emphasis on the, enhance the preserve and enhance which I think, if the number is correct, it's about 86% of Plano is already described as uh, preserve and enhance. And so that was simply a statement here is assurance for the future that we're going to preserve and enhance. Yeah, and so to my point, I think that if that's pulled out, some people on that committee may feel that that, that principle is, is the preserve and enhance is gone possibly from... It certainly, as I said, it, it was the, the second item the subcommittee dealt with, and uh, it certainly was brought out by compromise uh, of the four subcommittee members, and uh, they were very representative of the committee as a whole. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. Yes, sir. But do you think you should go under two? Uh, it would be better served as 1.6 as opposed to 2.4. Mm -hmm. uh, again, uh, I can speak for me personally and say that I would certainly be okay with it. I just look in 30 years, how can we anticipate anything? <laughs> just a, a bit of perspective on this. Um, when I look at, think about significant changes, it, to me in development, that I think about 
plan is 72 square miles. To me, a significant change in development has to be something that is a big chunk of the 72 square miles. So think about it relative to 72 square miles. So how much of 72 square miles has to change substantially to be a significant change? To me, that's, I'm looking at, in my mind, I visually think about the future land use map, and I think about major changes on the future land use map. Like, uh, did a business park go away? Did we change a major corridor? Did we change some major swath of a neighborhood? I think that is what I think of when I think of significant changes in development. I'm thinking the development pattern of the city. When I think of population, in the time frame I've been working for the city, we've grown approximately 40% in our population. We've grown a lot. I don't think we're going to grow anywhere close to that same amount in, in the, I mean, not even remotely that much. Are we so at, are we it, at three quarters of a percent per year now, Christina? Yes. 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 Okay. So to me. And that number will get smaller. Yeah. We're, well, we're even, even, we're going to, we just don't, even with infill and redevelopment, yeah. our growth will not be anywhere close yeah. from a percentage to where it has been in the past. If you think about technology yeah. and where technology is going, and just yeah. think about self-driving vehicles by themselves, yeah. just that by itself will fundamentally affect a significant change in the 72 miles or acres, whatever the number was you were talking about. And so all of a sudden, you don't have granted par properties coming to us and saying, would you slash my parking ratio from 3 per thousand to 2 per thousand? They're going to be saying, would you slash it to you know, half a parking space per thousand square feet and retail? I mean... Who knows how significant that's going to be? I can't wait for it and not have to be driving myself around. That kind of thing has already had, I mean, Uber has already had a dramatic impact on parks in downtown throughout the country. So there's a lot of things like that that I think will come. And in the 2050 timeframe, without a doubt. With mass transit and with self-driving vehicles, on demand or ride sharing, with you know, yeah. so it's, it's happening now. Yeah. Co-ownership or whatever. That real estate will be a lagging indicator on those things mm -hmm. because it's sure. such a huge investment. Yeah. But when you sure. mention like business parks or whatnot, and as we experience this change in workforce, that is something that could happen. We could have a business park that is all of a sudden 75% vacant and needs to be redeveloped, and that would be a significant change. And but what are you going to develop it to? Because you're not going to just build more offices there because that doesn't work. Right. So right. what are you going to turn it into? More retail? I, guess I don't know that we anticipate it, but, but at the same time, I, mean, I don't know that we don't anticipate it. More retail. Right. I guess, to me, is that something that we think is going to happen? I don't know. We just slide it to the left and we're done. I, I'm fine with sliding it to the left. <laughs> it's a very vague statement. Yeah, it really is. But I think it belongs in Plano today. Yeah. If you're going to leave it in, I would say put it on the left. If you, my preference. I'm in full support of that. Right. Not that we're trying to micromanage you or anything. If we, <laughs> make, if we make any we just changes, missed, uh, uh, 25 we minutes to them. Yes. Two point four. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yes. Even the slight change yep. of defining significant it, changes. It, 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 it goes back to them. They either prove it or they don't, and then we'll know what's proved and what's not, and then it will eventually, when we've got to a point to where we're done with everything, one way or the other, it will go into account. Okay. Well, they worked very hard. <laughs> well, true, but that's not, <laughs> that's not an excuse not to do our job. Is there, is there anything, I, I know we're going to kind of run out of time here in a bit. Is there anything we can do for you all? Uh, please send us more questions. The questions, it's really great because we can think about them and answer them. Send us more questions for two weeks. But is there anything else specifically you'd like us to address for the next meeting? And, and we, notwithstanding, we're going to have some information on uh, from the city attorney's office. So. Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing for, for me at least guidance that we're going to get on a couple of things that are in there and whether or not we're uh, would be smart to do something or, or uh, smart to take something out. I don't know what they're going to tell us. Yeah. Um, but I would much rather have that information before we make those decisions. But once we get that information, we need to be ready to roll up our sleeves. And if we've got additions that we want to make, and bring them to the table, bring them to the meeting. If not, we need to approve 
uh, changes and, and get the thing back to them so they can have yeah, it, on it. it. What you did at night is fine. That's a specific thing we right. can address. That, that's what we need, those yeah. things. That, yeah. That's what I'm saying is yeah. if, if there's other areas that any of the commission wants to see changed, it's not just in general. You've got to tell us what it is, what section you don't like, what sentence you don't like, what paragraph you don't like, what description of a building you don't like. Uh, we've got to have those. We've got to have those topics. So we're we're going to get. Hmm? With that email. Well, I, 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 email would be good, so we go into a meeting knowing. Because that way we don't miss anything, and and you yeah. can more, you know, make sure you're inclusive, and then we can make sure we got a thoughtful response. Yeah. So yeah. there's something that great. you don't agree with that's in there, and you want to pull out. Uh, but I also, and going back to what we talked about earlier, is our charge is to review and accept or, or ratify, change what the committee has given to us. Our job is not to rewrite this plan, because mm -hmm. this was a hell of a plan. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when it passed, it still is. Uh, it's better now. It will be better with uh, with a lot of the information that's provided in there. But we're not rewriting the thing from scratch. That's not our job. Um, our job is to look at the changes they've made and to accept them, to modify them, um, and so forth. Because we're going to get this done. We're going to get this done this summer, and we're going to get it to council uh, so that going into this fall, we have a united plan for the city. And hopefully, I'm probably living in, in Heritage World, but hopefully, some of the healing can begin in the city that's needed. And we'll have a document that everybody can live with, and it will be able to guide us and to guide council for years to come. So I take it. Um, <laughs> what the chairman said, the way I'm reading that is, is that we're pretty close. Everybody, they, we're, we've yeah. got a little bit more to talk about, but we're getting close. Is that a fair yeah. statement from the planning yeah, and zoning? Yeah. I, I would suggest you even be there with just a few things personally. I, I think you all did a fabulous job. I know it was a tremendous effort with a lot of back and forth, and I think that all the citizens involved in it deserve them. You know, with a big pat on the back. Doug no, would like to say, I think we're within the 20. Yes. The 20 yard line. So uh, I probably think we're on the two. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I really appreciate the thoughtfulness and uh, the insight that you bring on all of your questions and comments. And uh, everything that's been said here tonight, uh, I've heard in discussions on our committee from the legal standpoints that you're bringing up to all of the other things. Uh, those are. Uh, parts where we relied on the city staff and we went back and forth on a lot of different things in discussion. Uh, and so, you know, I really appreciate your thoughtfulness and thoroughness in uh, providing us feedback. And the committee looks forward to uh, getting back with what you've got. And uh, I join uh, Chairman Barbera in uh, the hopes that uh, we will have a new plan in place and get it before council uh, before December. December. <laughs> Oh, it'll be before the yeah. <laughs> it'll be before the All right. Well, thank you very much. Mr. Sefko, thank you, Mike. That's all we got. Here. And, uh, thank you for continuing the discussion when we get done at 10 tonight. You're hanging around. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm at your place. That is Whatever the news is that we do not need to come back <laughs> after the general meeting tonight. So. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I'll be alone. <laughs> well, thank you all for your input. And, and remember, get, get us your uh, email thoughts. Uh, don't. You know, if you have thoughts that you need to get down while you think about them, get them to us. If you've got something that you want to see in there, put it down on paper and let us see it. But don't forget that our job is to look at what the committee has given us, not just start from scratch. So. All right. Thank you guys very much. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we will now do the 29 Apple time, which is the most accurate time in the world. <laughs> uh, we will go into an agenda review for, well, we will start our preliminary open meeting. And the first thing on our agenda is our agenda review for tonight's meeting.
I'll call the meeting to order at 7.03. Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance. Uh, comments of public interest. This portion of the meeting is to allow up to three minutes per speaker with 30, minute, 30 total minutes on items of interest or concern and not on items that are on the current agenda. The Pub Planning and Zoning Commission may not discuss these items but may respond with factual or policy information. The Planning and Zoning Commission may choose to place the item on a future agenda. Thank you. We have any speaker cards? We do. We have Mr. Bill Lyle. Mr. Lyle. Good evening. My name is Bill Lyle III. I reside at 1724 15th Place here in East Plano. And I'm bringing an issue before you tonight that is so inconsequential, it might not be worth the two minutes or three it takes me to explain it to you. In our zoning ordinance, we have a backyard cottage ordinance. Um, very few cottages have been built in Plano. This was passed a few years ago. Making it even less in, or less consequential is the fact that very few lots in or very few homes in Plano are built on more than one lot. I happen to own a residential lot, and if you look at your planning and zoning map, there's just one square around it. But if you go to the Collin County Central Appraisal District website, you'll see that I actually am on lot 12 and 13. A. So when you go back to the cottage ordinance, it requires that the building setback matches the structure on the lot. Since I'm on a lot and a half, my setback is greater than my neighbor's setback. So I have a 10 foot setback, they have a six and a half foot setback off of the side yard property lines. So the point of the cottage ordinance is to allow people to maximize their space and to put another little structure to house an el uh, elderly parent or so forth, which is my goal. And then you have this additional setback that makes sense for the larger home since it is on a larger lot, but doesn't make sense for this little cottage that I'm trying to put in the backyard. And so I'm asking you all to put on a future agenda the idea that the cottage ordinance setback would match the lot. Just to further expand on this, my neighbors could build a cottage, cottage six. So it's, it's small and it affects very, very few people in Plano. My lot was developed a long time ago, uh, given that it was here in East Plano. Most homes are not on a lot and a half anymore. It's just one lot. Um, and so Anyway, I'm just asking that y'all might put that on a future agenda and that the setback would match, uh, I guess the staff can guide you on whether they had, you know, think this is a good idea or a bad idea, but just that the setback would match, like if the, if the building's on one lot, the setback would be the same for a structure on one lot and wouldn't have to match the, the structure that's on the lot and a half, if that makes any sense. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Law. Any other speaker cards on public comments? No, there are not. All right, well then let's move to the consent agenda, please. The consent agenda will be acted upon in one motion and contains items which are routine and typically non-controversial. Items may be removed from this agenda for individual consideration by commissioners, staff, or any citizen. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests. Does anyone wish to remove anything from the consent agenda? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to remove, uh, set aside preliminary site plan uh, agenda item D for the CRUMC edition. Okay. Agenda item D shall be removed from the consent agenda and will be covered in our uh, public discussion. What about the remainder of our consent agendas, items B, C, and E? I'm sorry, A, B, C, and E. Move we approve. I have a motion to approve the consent agenda items A, B, C, and E by Commissioner Gibbons and a second by Commissioner Downs. Please cast your vote. And the consent agenda minus item D passes with a vote of eight to zero. Is 
We'll now move to our public hearing. We'll start public hearings with, starting with agenda item D from our consent agenda. Um, we won't take that one as a public hearing, though, right? We'll just take it as an individual agenda item. I'm there we go. Exactly. Items for individual consideration, public hearing items. P applicants are limited to 15 minutes presentation time with a five minute rebuttal if needed. Remaining speakers are limited to 30 minute total of testimony time with three minutes assigned per speaker. The presiding officer may modify these times as deemed necessary. Uh, Chair Barbera, we have items that are being presented with their companions. Would it please the commission to hold the public hearing for items one and one 1A and 1B together? Yes, as soon as we get to consent to agenda item D. D? So we'll okay. carry that first. Is your, is your mic on? There we go. There we go. I'm reviewing the preliminary site plan for Custer Road United Methodist Church, and I'm happy to answer any questions. All right. Um, I have a question. When was that property zoned for multifamily? Sure. It was rezoned from agricultural to PD 101 multifamily three in 1983. And then in 1994, the PD was removed because there were no stipulations. So it goes all the way back to 1983. It's been zoned in that manner, correct? Yes. Thank you. Any other questions for staff on this item? I have questions. Now, with the 359 units, it's compliant with multifamily three? Yes, there's a max density of 21 and a half units per acre, and they're at 21. 21. And has there been a traffic study on this? On this? Um, I don't believe a traffic impact analysis was required with this submittal. Okay. Any review by the fire department? It was. Okay. And their findings? Pardon? And their findings? They approved the preliminary site plan. And the school district also? The school district was not required to okay. review this submittal. And it's my understanding in the middle of this property, there's going to be a, a parking structure. Is that correct? Yes, there's a parking structure in the middle with about 296 spaces. Okay. So the, the resident prop, residential property, I mean, the, the property bordering the residents on the east side are going to be one story, similar to the units on the, the south side are going to be one story. Then further in along the street of Legacy and Custer, there are going to be two stories. And then the buildings on the interior will be three stories. Yes, that's correct. And the buildings on the exterior have parking garages in them as well. Okay. For the individual units. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for staff on item D? No, thank you very much. No approval of item D. All right, we have a motion to approve item D by Commissioner Downs with a second by Commissioner Walters. Please cast your vote when able. And consent agenda item D passes with a vote of eight to zero. Now that brings us to our public hearings, we'll, and we will do one A and one B together. Agenda item number one, public hearing, zoning case 2021-007, request to rezone 1.5 acres located at the northwest corner of Turtle Creek Drive and Old Westbury Lane from planned de development 342 single family residence nine to planned development 423 patio home. Zone plan development 342 single family resident nine with specific use permit number 50 eight for country club and private club applicants shadow Ab acquisitions llc agenda item number one b is a revised concept plan willow bend polo estates phase b block b lots one through 19 19 patio home lots on 3.1 acres located at the northwest corner of turtle creek drive and old westbury lane Zone Plan Development 342 Single Family Residence 9 and Plan Development 3, 423 Patio Home. Applicant again is Shattuck Acquisitions LLC. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Greg Fisher. I'm a senior planner with the planning department. Uh, the request before you today is to rezone a portion of an existing community center. You can see the existing zoning on the map today. 
Uh, the applicant is requesting to rezone 1.5 acres on the eastern side of the community center lot to match the zoning on the west side. Uh, next slide, please. Here you see an aerial image of the subject property outlined in yellow. Uh, the surrounding land uses on all sides are single family residences. To the east, south, and north are single family residences zoned plan development SF9. And to the to the west is the, the remainder of the community center and patio home, single family residences zoned plan development. The purpose of this request is to, cons is to create a uniform zoning district for the entire uh, currently developed with a community center that consists of tennis courts and a clubhouse. There was a swimming pool on site that has since been filled in and a building on the north side of the property um, that is no longer being used, that is vacant. Next slide, please. The applicant has submitted a concept plan as stated as agenda item 1B. The applicant is proposing to develop 19 patio home lots with an alley running north to south, the nine lots fronting Old Westbury Lane and nine lots fronting Shattuck Boulevard on the west. Next slide, please. Again, here's a, another look at the existing zoning. I want to emphasize that the, only the portion highlighted in green is uh, the, the case of this, the subject of this zoning case. The applicant would like to rezone that to match the zoning on the western portion, the plan development 423 patio home. Next slide, please. So taking a look at the comprehensive plan, uh, the future land use map designates this property as major public and semi-public, uh, or PSP for short. The PSP designation uh, looks at uh, having large um, open space, golf courses, schools, universities, um, things of that nature. Um, You'll see the, the aerial image to the, to the right on your screen shows the existing development patterns. Not all of the area designated as PSP is open space. Um, and it should be, it's important to note that the entire vicinity, this area is designated as PSP on the future land use map is zoned for single family residential. It's the subject property, the community center could be developed today with single family residential uses. Uh, with SF9 lots fronting Old Westbury Lane on the eastern side and patio home lots on the west side fronting Shattuck Boulevard. Staff estimates a total of 15 homes could be developed on the subject property today as it's presently zoned. Next slide, please. Uh, I took a few bullet points from the comprehensive plan that I wanted to emphasize. Uh, the city seeks attractive, inclusive, and cohesive residential neighborhoods with a mix of housing options. Um, infill is defined as development that occurs on vacant land or redevelopment of an existing site surrounded by other improved properties uh, and existing housing stock. Next slide, please. So PD 423 patio home, which is the proposed zoning district for the entire community center lot has these standards in place today. One minimum lot size of 5,500 square feet the minimum lot width of 50 feet and no open space requirements. The applicant is not proposing any changes to these stipulations and if approved, the entire uh, community center would be developed with these stipulations. Next slide. But looking at neighborhood compatibility throughout the city, the, within our single family zoning districts, there's a range of, of land uses uh, ranging from you know, duplexes uh, to patio home to single family zoning districts from SF6 to SF9 up to SF20 and estate development. This type of transition from one single family zoning district to another is common throughout the city. Uh, with this request, the subject property could be under one uniform zoning district. There wouldn't be any split zoned properties. So the purpose of this request is to, to clean that up and have a uniform standard for the entire parcel. Next slide, please. Uh, with this proposed development, the amount of open space in the community would, would de decrease, uh, but 
as I've stated previously, this property could develop today as it's currently zoned. Um, there are two existing, or one, excuse me, one existing specific use permit for the property, uh, SUP number 58 for country club and private club. Uh, if the city council approves this zoning request, PNZ recommends that you, the Planning and Zoning Commission, call a public hearing to rescind that SUP as it would no longer be appropriate for a single family neighborhood. Next slide, please. So with that, this item is recommended for approval uh, as submitted subject to the Planning and Zoning Commission calling a public hearing to rescind SUP number 58. Next slide, please. So we did receive uh, these numbers that you see before you are as of Friday afternoon, June 4th. Uh, since the packet was sent to you, I did receive three additional letters, which I handed out to you today. Um, but these numbers show four official letters in support, one neutral and five in opposition. The three that I handed out just as the meeting was started, two additional responses were in opposition and one neutral. All three of those letters that I handed out are within the 200 foot boundary. So they would Im impact the, uh, or, or bring the, the votes closer to requiring a super majority. But I don't, I don't have that information before you exactly what that is. Next slide, please. Here's a look at the total number of responses that we received as of Friday afternoon, 12 responses in support three neutral and 15 in opposition for a total of 30. Um, you'll see my note there, we did receive 37 total responses, but some were duplicates. That's a 30 total responses did come in. And the, the map to the right shows responses within the neighborhood. Next slide, please. This map shows the total, num the total responses received with one uh, further out from the neighborhood. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. So, uh, agenda item 1B is the revised concept plan. Purpose of this plan is to show the proposed 19 patio home lots and this item is recommended for approval subject to city council approval of zoning case 2021-007. Uh, that concludes my presentation. I'm available to answer any questions that the commission may have. Thank you, Craig. Um, let me ask you: the vast, let's say the vast, the majority of the property is already zoned for the patio homes. It's just that sliver on the backside, correct? Correct. And and the property that's just to the west, it's the same zoning patio home as the as those right across the street, correct? Yes, that's and there's correct. There's no reduction in lot size requested. There's no reduction in setbacks requested. It just matches the zoning that's right across the street, correct? Yes, that's the request. Thank you. Any other questions for staff, Mr. Downs? Yeah, just for clarification, you did give us three additional letters. Did you say those all came from within the 200 foot area? That's correct. Okay, and based on the slide that you presented that showed the numbers opposed, it said five and that represented 10%. So with two of the three you gave us, we can assume there's roughly 14% maybe. That's that a is. safe assumption, but I, I don't have that specific number. Okay. Well, I'm just a little math in my head. Um, okay. That's that's it for now. Thank you. Any further technical questions for staff? Mr. Stone. Uh, yes. One of the uh, response letters raised the question about overflow or guest parking for these lots. Can you tell us, uh, Craig, if there are requirements for the developer to provide that in this particular location? Guest parking is required in patio home zoning district. Uh, On-street parking can be used uh, to meet that requirement. I, I believe it's a half of a parking space per lot is required. We haven't seen an actual site plan with, with uh, parking slots and garages and that kind of thing, have we? Not no, yet. The, the concept plan shows 19 yeah. Uh, lots served by an alley, yeah. uh, a driveway would re be required off of that alley and two garage spaces would be required per the zoning district. Right. Okay. Uh, one other quick question. One of the other letters raised the issue of water runoff and whether or not some studies need to be made. Uh, have you, would you care to comment on that? Do, do, should we have a hydraulic study for this location? 
Um, moving forward, uh, full civil engineering plans will be required for this okay. development, and those plans will be reviewed by the engineering department for conformance with our stormwater regulations. Good. Thank you. Yes. Any further questions for staff? No? Thank you, Craig. I will now open the public hearing on agenda items 1A and 1B. Does the applicant wish to address the commission? Yes, yes we have Mr. William Shallock. I guess if you pull the PowerPoint slides up, thank you. Okay, thank you. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Will Shattuck with Shattuck Development Company. It feels good being up here. I'm excited to uh, address you tonight uh, and talk about Willow and Polo Estates. Is there a next slide? Uh, so Shattuck Development Company was founded 45 years ago by Bill and Peter Shattuck. We've developed 46 neighborhoods consisting of 85 phases, generally located in North Dallas, including 13 neighborhoods generally concentrated in West Plano. Next slide, please. Uh, so I won't go through the list um, of Plano developments uh, we built, but uh, one of those in particular is Willoughby Polo Estates. We developed uh, just about every phase of Willoughby Polo Estates, and I think it's a first class uh, neighborhood in the city of Plano. And next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, so just to give a little history on uh, this site, in the early 90s, uh, my family purchased the property surrounding this site and developed, uh, developed the subdivision. It was once known as the Willowbin Polo and Hunt Club for those uh, that have been in Plano for, uh, for some time. and. Uh, uh, definitely enjoyed by its residents. Um, but in late 2020, the Apollo Group that owns uh, Glen Eagles um, decided to shutter the facility <coughs> as opposed to renovate it and sell it and spend the, uh, spend the money uh, on their uh, location on Park Boulevard, which I think is actually an agenda item tonight, um, uh, if I read correctly. Uh, next slide. So what is our goal here? Why are we, uh, why are we rezoning or asking to rezone the property? So our goal with this buyer or uh, product is, a, is to deliver a home and a lot for a wealthy downsizing empty nester. We would like for the homes to be new, custom, architecturally drawn homes with first floor master bedrooms, have high end finish out with outdoor living and have a pool optional size rear yard. Next slide, please. Uh, so, um, Craig uh, went over this, but but we're uh, asking to apply PD 423 to the entire lot and uh, and uh, I guess leave the same restrictions that are in place under PD 423, but we do have a 6,500 square foot average lot size, which is substantially larger than uh, what's what the minimum is required and what a patio home a standard patio home may be in Plano. So I guess I don't necessarily consider it to be a patio home lot. I, I, it, to me, is a, is a, I guess, built as a single family lot with patio home uh, restrictions. Uh, so I guess I don't have a laser pointer, but, um, but just kind of wanted to go over like what that product looks like. So we're proposing 19 rear entry lots. They're 50 by 125. Uh, we expect these houses to sell for a million to a million five. Uh, probably closer to uh, the middle, higher end of that range. Uh, and they'll generally be 3,000 to 4,000 feet with, I, I, I estimate them in the higher end of that range, 3,500, 4,000 feet. Um, the patio home underlying zoning gives us the ability to build those an 87 foot deep pad, which gives us the ability to put downstairs master bedrooms, have that, um, ha have that nice long deep pad where I think, I mean, they might have bonus rooms on the second floor, but, but generally people that are empty nesters and wealthy, they want a big one-story home with, um, with bonus rooms upstairs. So uh, what does the rear entry product allow you to do? Well, the rear entry product pulls all the cars off the street. Uh, you have consistent streetscape where uh, you're not chopped up by driveway, driveway, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, trash can, trash can, mailbox, mailbox, you know, it, it's, um, it gives us like this nice, clean streetscape, pulls the cars off the street, and the only people that will be parking there will be visitors, which are 
uh, I guess every now and then, which is normal in, in any in any neighborhood. Um, I'd like to also note that Shattuck Boulevard is a 65 foot right away in a wider street uh, than a typical interior street and no lot. Uh, so the face of all these lot, uh, houses won't face um, another house, right? So it faces side yards, it faces like an interior, uh, some interior hardscape along Shattuck Boulevard and uh, uh, I guess it's Castle, uh, Castle Gate. Um, so you, you basically have single loaded streets throughout the community. Uh, what this also does is it allows us to put all the utilities in the back of the lot. So um, you have a sewer line that goes down the back of the lot. You've got all, all the utilities. We're gonna have to grab water a few places, but for the most part, we're gonna be utilizing existing uh, city infrastructure, which uh, I know uh, pleases the city of Plano. Um, we are also proposing, which is not in this site plan, but um, I guess is the way this is will be determined um, will be, I guess, through like we, we plan to, I'm going to get to the HOA portion of this, but we plan to be annexing the port, uh, annex into the HOA. And by doing so, we'll have some landscape buffers on the end of these blocks, uh, which I'll, I'll discuss, but um, it's going to deliver just like a nice clean streetscape surrounding the community. Next slide, please. Okay, so currently, um, I wanted to kind of show what is what is, what does the streetscape look like today. Um, so, uh, on Turtle Creek on the south side, uh, we actually put those patinas in to block the view, like 25 years ago. Uh, but um, we've got patina line tennis fence and overhead lights. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, on the north side, uh, I guess is where Shattuck Boulevard ties into Castle Gate. Uh, there's an old tack house. Uh, there's two filled in swimming pools. Uh, I think it's a trash, I, I can't tell if it's like equipment, but it's uh, behind a kind of a, a, a fence up there. Uh, yeah, right right there. So I, uh, it's not very sightly today. And the that little white house is abandoned. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and on Old Westbury, um, it's also a Fatinia uh, line street with, um, with a tennis fence, as well as a parking lot, uh, kind of backside of that building in a dumpster. Uh, next slide, please. So we're proposing, I had this rendering done um, at the end of the blocks on the north side and south side, which I guess is somewhat to be determined because if we, um, it, 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 we plan on building, you know, building this regardless, but who would maintain it, whether it be a landscape buffer or part of a lot I guess would be to, to be determined, but um, we uh, we we wanted to build a uh, like an iron fence with uh, columns that matched the uh, the columns in the community with shrubs on the outside of the iron fence for privacy, landscape beds, uh, benches, and uh, basically the biggest trees we can fit in between uh, the fence and uh, sidewalk. Um, also, in talking with a, a homeowner that expressed um, uh, some concern about the alley. Uh, my plan is to dress up uh, the, the, alley, uh, the alley entrance uh, is, as much as possible, possibly with some kind of paver, uh, some decorative pavers in addition to uh, some seriously upsized landscaping. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I've reached out to the HOA several times. Um, uh, in February, um, I've had meetings with the board uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, in April, I had a Zoom call with the residents, just go, hey, if you want, if you have any questions, you saw the zoning sign go, uh, go up, get on the Zoom call. Uh, and then in May, uh, the HOA had an annual meeting, uh, which was lively, and um, at Glen Eagles, and uh, and I went through a similar presentation to this and uh, answered questions. Uh, and you know, I, on an ongoing basis, I've, I've, I've given out my, my email. It's on the sign at the interest of the community and I've answered questions. Uh, people people had a, a question or a concern or frankly, or they wanted to buy a lot, right? Um, so uh, next uh, next slide. Uh, this is a letter of support from the, uh, from the uh, board. Uh, I won't go through all of it, um, but uh, in support of uh, this son case. 
Uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, as I told the board and the residents, uh, I intend to voluntarily annex uh, these lots into the homeowners association uh, for several reasons. You have dues paying uh, residents, right? Um, they can enforce maintenance and uh, let's, let's just say there's, there's all kinds of things that can happen in a neighborhood and they can, they can enforce those uh, compliance with those, uh, with those things. And they can ensure quality and architectural guidelines are followed. So um, those are something we'll, we'll come up together and, uh, and I, I think it'll, it'll, it'll be a, an excellent product. I, I think the board is very happy uh, with, with what we're proposing and, um, and I, I hope that you guys are too. Uh, next slide. So uh, this, so people say, you know, they, they sometimes they get fixated on the patio home product, and you might. Um, it and I, I guess what I wanted to show is what a rear entry fifty foot lot home can look like, and basically, while these aren't the homes necessarily they're going to be built in the neighborhood, uh, I wanted to show uh, what. What is that? What is that house? What can that house look like um, on a lot that size? Uh, so these are two examples. The house on the left is my house. Um, I live on a lot just like this, and I love it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just two more examples. Next slide. And next slide. Um, so I guess that concludes my presentation, but i um, happy to answer any questions now or uh, after um, we have uh, uh, other uh, residents speak. Does the commission have questions to the applicant, Mr. Gibbons? Uh, whenever you say the board of the HOA uh, endorsed this, give me an idea of where that HOA exists. Is that the houses to the east or the patio homes to the north and West. It, it completely surrounds the site. The whole, so all of those are part of the same HOA. Yes, sir. Okay. The, there's a different HOA. That's there's some townhomes that are a little further west at Parkwood and Park Boulevard, which are a separate HOA, from okay. my understanding. Thanks. But the HOA includes the homes to the east. They're the SF9. Yes. Right. East, uh, I guess technically south, but um, uh, east, north, and and west. Okay. Uh, I have one question, um, and. Um, it's hard for me to approve this request because those tennis courts in that pool I grew up in, <laughs> I grew up on. And now that Concrete Mall is gone, this is the last bastion of my childhood that still exists in Plano. But I won't let that stand in my way of any vote on this matter. Any other questions for the applicant? No? All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. We'll go ahead and open the public hearing. Do we have any speaker cards on this item? We do. We have four individuals. First is Dave Cornell. Good evening, Commissioner. I'm Dave Cornell. I'm an architect. I reside at 5921 Crown Over Court, which basically looks at the dumpster that is on the lot. Um, beautiful trees there that we're, quite frankly, going to hate to lose. Uh, but yet, it is, I want to make three points. It is rezoning this is going to happen, whether it happens tonight, next month at City Council, next year, five years from now, the rezoning of this will happen simply because you can't necessarily have this single family nine component with a patio home component. The single family nine basically is of size that you can't build anything on unless it was like 20 feet wide and 150 feet long, uh, probably not in the a marketable product. That's what brings me to the second point of what Mr. Shattuck is proposing here is something that is very much certainly in the housing issues that we currently have is this is a very marketable product and certainly by evidence of the fact that he already has a large degree of interest in this product um, i would venture to say he is uh, if this was to hit the market today um, he would probably sell a dozen of them today uh, it's that much interest in the market, and certainly we know that real estate is a market-driven entity. The last point I want to make is that what I see this is, is really for us as an HOA and residents there, this is protection. This is protection in that we have a developer who 
has long-standing history in the neighborhood, has already built this. Uh, it's basically him, his son, the Shattuck family coming back and finishing out what they started, if you will. And it's like, uh, he's got a good product. It's, uh, yeah, it's in the price uh, range that really our, re our residences as they exist. Uh, fully, I expect is that we're gonna get a little bump out of this uh, upward, not down. Uh, so it's like, uh, I think it's protection for us in that uh, we have a developer who is willing to sit at the table with us, listen to what our concerns are, and if it's things like parking, if it's things like mailboxes, it's like, let, let's sit down. The, the purpose of the meeting tonight is more, let's change the zoning designation. We'll work out the details after the fact. I appreciate your time and encourage you to uh, pass this uh, uh, agenda item. Thank you. Thanks, speaker, please. Next speaker is uh, Ravi Jain. Ma'am, I said I want to go at the end. Okay. Then next is uh, Ryan Rizanki. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ryan Rizakani. I come to you today because, as you can see, Mr. Shaddock said the proposed plan was for $1.5 billion. Um, I come to you today, but he has not officially said he will propose the build. Has he accepted that when will the build date be? As many of you know, materials, labor, is at a shortage. So the people that live on the homes, they're going to have to wait for how long for these homes to get built. $1.5 million is a very steep price, and it's a proposed price. There's no um, promise that these prices will be set. Another thing is that, like you said, the tennis courts, it was something for people to come have a good time, the kids, the families. But to maximize his profit, he wants to put more patio homes. And then the homes on the other side, will the value will decrease because who wants to have a home next to a patio home? More on the other side, like you were talking about, the patio homes are all patio homes. There's no other area where there's half patio homes and then half homes. But still, the homes on the corner lot that was proposed to be changed will become uh, affected in pricing. And so I come to you today to say, Many of these things are all uh, hypotheticals. You know, if we have this, it'll build this one year, two years. Many of these people are acting like it's already, you know, cooked and to be done. But my question is, who's going to benefit from this plan most? Is it for the people of the community or is it for the pockets of the builders, the pockets of the, of the people involved in the um, build? Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next is Saeed Rizai. Yes. Good afternoon. My name is Saeed Reze. I'm a professional civil engineer with 42 years experience. I work for the city of Dallas and other entities. And I live on uh, Turtle Creek. And uh, I have a couple of issues. One of them is the uh, storm deranged. Uh, as you saw in that drawing, it would be in an alley in the middle of these uh, houses. Houses would split on half and uh, this become like a channel. After we have heavy rain like today, right now, without this uh, development, uh, Turtle Creek, all the water from the area comes to Turtle Creek to go to the creek. And it's like a channel. It comes as an inlet front of my house, and the water jumps to the yard. So I'm asking the developer to hire his consultant engineer and do a study on hydraulic uh, for storm drainage. Otherwise, it's going to be a, a pretty bad situation after we have this heavy rain. Uh, the other issue I have is going to be the parking, because these streets are only 50 feet wide. And uh, having building those houses, they, they don't have any parking for guests or any situation, any party, anything. These are only two car garage and there's nothing else left. After they put 4,000 square foot in these uh, small lots, there won't be nothing left to park a car. On the patio homes on the west side, there is parking lot. On the side of the street, they left out room to put car parking there. So they have garage in the back, 
and uh, parking for the guests on front, but off the road, not on the side of the road. So uh, that's another concern I have. And uh, uh, also I was looking at those lots, those lots, the square footage on you see on there for the lot is exaggerated. It's not, it's about 250, 300 feet square foot exaggerated. So that's, that's not much, but um, all I can say that the way it is, uh, is not correct. So I'm asking you all to see if you could uh, uh, talk to the developer and see if you can revise the drawing and it's not put in 19 houses, they can put smaller, you know, smaller minimum houses, but bigger score footage to match the houses on, on the side of Turtle Creek or other area next to it. So uh, I can say that uh, these 19 houses will bring lots of pollution, lots of uh, traffic, and uh, uh, it would devaluate the properties. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next, we have David Edwards. Good evening. Um, I'm a resident on uh, Crown Over Court. Um, originally built our house we've been there uh, for 25 years built in 95 one of the first residents on uh, in the subdivision uh, one of the concerns i have currently is the drainage um, i live at the uh, very end of crown over court at 5900 and we're having drainage issues today in fact working with allison smith and your um, uh, maintenance I'm trying to think what engineering department and uh, been, this has been an ongoing issue for two years and uh, we're having drainage issues. We have easements on both sides of our house. The one side uh, goes back behind our, our property into Turtle Creek. That is not draining at all. And we're supposed to be within the next, I think two months having that redone uh, from the city. Uh, but the other, so the, I think the a hydro survey is something that must be done because you can drive last couple of days we've had, uh, or last couple of weeks we've had extreme, uh, extreme weather as far as rain. We have water on the crown over at the end of the street that is basically running over the, the edge of the curb. So adding additional houses, taking away some of the green belt that's on the tennis court and the, the uh, development today is only going to get minimized more with housing. And I don't feel that there's adequate uh, runoff. Also, the other, another issue I have is the uh, level of the lot. If you stand at the end of our street and you look down at the tennis courts today, there's elevation that's probably five or six feet at the very peak higher than what the rest of the uh, neighborhood is. I don't know. We've, we asked in the homeowners, uh, uh, meeting that we had uh, to Mr. Shattuck, is that, gonna, that grade going to remain the same or is it going to be brought down to where it's closer to the other homes? And don't have any kind of answer on that. Um, and also parking. Um, parking is a real issue. If you come down, after you, if you're on Shattuck, I don't think that there would be a parking issue because the roads are a lot wider there. But if you're on uh, Turtle Creek or on Old Westbury, there's no set off at all for, for parking. And not only before the houses are built, townhomes or whatever they plan on the finished product, once that, during that construction, there's no way to get in the neighborhood. You can have con uh, uh, construction trucks, you can have trades. There's only one way to get in out of our street, either go down crown over, turn right or turn left. The only way out. And that's gonna be an ongoing issue that I feel that we're gonna be experiencing for two to three years, however long the time frame is set for these lots to be sold and developed. Mr. So Edwards, after, after your Mr. three Static, minutes are up. Pardon? Sorry, your three minutes are up. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. 
Do we have any additional speaker cards? Uh, we have Mr. Uh, Ravi Jain. Yes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ravi Jain, and I live in uh, on Turtle Creek, right in front of the proposed rezoned rezoning property. Can we? I have requested two foils. Could you show the first foil, please? Staff could pull the um, speaker slides up, please. You have shown them before. That's, that's okay. Keep going. That's one before this one. That's the one. Okay. Well, I think this is the proposal that Mr. Shadok has presented to the city council for rezoning. And if you look at it, the north side, east side, west side, all the houses around this property are either the side of the houses or the back. But if you look at Turtle Creek, that's where I live. Right in the middle, he's showing an alley. And right where the alley comes out, right in front of my house, there is a beautiful Odeca shape. It's all upscale Class A properties here. And I cannot see how you can zone this, rezone this thing and have this alley come in right in front of one of the most upscale house on which I just got through spending $110,000 getting the whole brand new roof done, more expensive. Uh, in the last two months, I have worked with Mr. Shadow quite a bit. He's very businesslike, very cordial, and willing to work with me, but he has never given me any assurance that he can rework this plan, much better plan that I have proposed to him. But. I am very much concerned if the proposal or this proper, if this rezoning is approved as it is or it moves as it is, I am very strongly opposed to it, just like a lot of other my neighbors. So I want to, I have proposed to him an alternative way. Can you show the next slide, please? Right there. He is proposing 19 homes, the first top. 15, in my alternative proposal, is absolutely no change, none whatsoever. None whatsoever. But I have taken his South Four property, South Four houses that our patty home is going to build, and relayed out, meeting his requirement of the size, minimum size of the pads. And I can convert those four into five, five lots, as it is shown right there, meet all the requirements. And there will not be any alley coming into on the face of the new, uh, in front of any of the existing homes there. And he Mr. can bring Jean. the alley and then move it to the at right angle to the Westbury side, which is going to Mr. Face John, you've you've reached your three minute limit. Huh? I'm sorry, you've reached your three minute. You reach your time. You finish up in just a few seconds. Okay. Fine. But anyhow, this is what I'm proposing, and uh, his four plots on the south side converts into five lots. He has much better pro, you know, pro, chance of making money and all those lots probably will sell for even more money than he can sell right now after, you know. So I do not know why his resistance is, why he doesn't work with me even though he keeps telling me he's going to work with me, he's going to take care of it. But as far as I'm concerned, all bets are off once this proposal is approved as it is and he can do what he like. However, I'm prepared to take my vote against it to neutral or for it if he's willing to work with me and get this thing done. And I think this is a much better proposal. And he tells me that if he does it like this way, he will have problem with the water drainage and all that. 
I am electrical engineer. As an electrical engineer, we are taught civil engineering 101 and mechanical engineering 101. And I have studied it. I have gone around it, look at the, you know, how the water is flowing. There will be much less water flowing or the water distribution will be even better than what he has right now. And his objection that he has given to me one time is, well, they will be flooding on all that. I like to challenge him or his design engineer tell me how there will be more flooding there. But I will go along with him and take my negative vote for it if he takes this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Do we have any further speaker cards? There are no more speakers. All right. Well, with that, I will close the public hearing. I'm sorry. Does the applicant wish to? Yeah. A couple minutes. How many minutes? Is it five? five? Okay. Okay. So I'll try not to take up all five. Um, so there was a, there was a question about... Um, uh, I guess about uh, so one gentleman asked about uh, the CVUs. So if you think about CVUs, there's a maximum of 20 subs a day, one from the male person and 19 per house, right? Or 19 houses that would, that would utilize these. Some of those are going to walk and some of those will drive. And those are for a maximum of 45 seconds. So I don't, so I guess that combined with the fact that these are rear entry lots with, um, with, without a chopped up, uh, Front Street, in my opinion, uh, does not warrant um, uh, any off-street parking. Um, I, I think it's just transitional, um, just like any normal street. Um, so if, but if, I guess when you, when you see off-street parking for CVUs, that's typically when the whole neighborhood is assigned to like those boxes and you've got like 200 people that use them and it's a, it's a different, different type of deal. Um, so, uh, one gentleman asked about the uh, timeline. Uh, assuming uh, this is approved tonight and at City Council, uh, I plan to immediately start the demolition of the facility uh, as soon as I can get a contractor on site and as soon as I can get the plans approved, um, I'm going to start construction and I'm going to sell the lots as quickly as possible. Um, there, there's no, there's no investment, like there's no reason to wait. I'm not looking to for any appreciation. Um, so as far as the price points are concerned, based on where we sell these lots at um, and based on comps, uh, these homes will at a minimum be a million two fifty to a million five, which is I think where the, uh, the, I guess like kind of our target price point. I don't think we can build a house here with this type of product for under a million and I don't, and I don't think the market would support much over a million five. Um, let's see. Uh, so as far as drainage is concerned, I don't, I don't think you need to pull up the slide, but if you can picture, um, if you can picture this lot, it's probably 90% covered by concrete or a roof of the facilities, maybe 85. You've got eight tennis courts, which cover like the bottom half of it. Then you've got two big parking lots. You've got two pools that are filled in and you've got two buildings, right? And a sidewalk that surrounds it. Um, so while there are a few trees on site and a little bit of greenery, this, like our coverage of the site is gonna great greatly reduce the impermeable surface of, uh, of the site, which should greatly reduce the, I'm not an engineer, but should greatly reduce the amount of runoff because of the additional green space uh, that doesn't exist here today. In addition, um, like, like I said, not an engineer, but uh, that would greatly uh, reduce the amount of runoff. Uh, furthermore, half of the drainage should go west on the west side and half the drainage should go east, uh, which should just, I guess what I'm saying is I think it's going to greatly reduce the, the, the drainage situation. And I can't speak to the gentleman that lives, I think he said at the end of Crown Over in the alley, but, but I don't, there isn't any drainage from the site that I'm aware of that's, that's going to go in his direction. Uh, let's see. I, I, think, I think I answered all the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shack. With that, I will close the public hearing and find comments and discussion to the commission and staff. Here. A, a couple questions for Mr. Shedd. So you said you're uh, ready to build immediately. Uh, you guys have great experience doing this and do quality work. I think people know that. Uh, yes, what sir. do you think your timeline is then, assuming what you know today for completion of this particular neighborhood addition? You know, if it, uh, if, I don't know, 
like the gentleman said, hey, some things are hard to get done today, right? Um, but assuming a demolition crew can get in in June, I mean, sorry, in, in July, um, say it takes a month to demo it or a couple weeks, and uh, if Greg can have the plans turned in and approved by the city of Plano, uh, I would anticipate it taking six to eight months to build that subdivision. And, and the re it would take longer if it was a bigger subdivision, but because there's not as much infrastructure i think it'll it won't take as long to build so that would put us at second quarter 2022 and um i think these i've already got i think i think 19 like maybe 18 or 19 people that live in the community that want to buy houses in this neighborhood uh in that live in what that were just notified i haven't marketed the community they just they got it they got the information from the um uh, from the, 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 the notice letters. So based on what you know, you don't think it's a three-year timeline at this point? I, I, don't, I don't think it's a three-year timeline, but but I would anticipate it takes 18 months probably from from the completion. So uh, so site, and, site work would be done by second quarter 2022 and then probably by the end of 2023, I would, I mean, I don't get paid until they're sold and built. So I would, I would hope it would go quickly. Okay, thanks. Um, second question. Um, how many bedrooms will each of these homes have on the average? That's a that's a great question. And a four thousand square foot house or thirty five hundred. I mean, and I, I, I guess my real question is this: How many occupants do you think will be in each house? And and actually, my real question is: How many cars do you think will be um, in each house? Because I think there's a two car garages. You said yes, sir. And so tandem, it might and, and so this question is really about parking, which I do have some concern for the citizens around there on the parking. Um, and so how do you think would be at each house ultimately? Have you guys given that some thought? Because I do think it might matter. I, I, I think, um, I mean, since because it's a downsizing empty nester, um, I would start with two. And uh, I mean, they might have a service person every now and then uh, come or a guest. Uh, but I wouldn't, anti I wouldn't anticipate there being, um, I mean, anybody can buy the house, buy the house, right? We can't, we can't say like, well, you got a family, you know, you can't buy it, but, but every one of these people that have come to me that live in the community are empty nesters today that don't have children living at home. Um, uh, so I, I would guess how many bedrooms, um, uh, one on the first floor, I assume, because these are, uh, uh, empty nesters, right? They don't want to walk upstairs. Maybe they have an elevator. Uh, but I would guess like three bedrooms because, and the reason I say three is generally they're going to want bonus rooms because if their grandkids come or for Christmas or for Easter, come spend the night, I mean, they're going to want like, they're going to want a place that those grandkids can kind of come mm -hmm. sleep at. But I would guess that there wouldn't be a full time person living in those bedrooms. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, I have a quick question for Mr. Shattuck, if you would, please. Thank you for your presentation tonight. Uh, part of the material that we were furnished by the city, I'm going to read here. Today, the zoning allows development by right of 15 single-family homes, including nine patio homes and six SF9 homes. You could build those 15 houses today, and all of this would go away. My question to you is, is it how important are those other four patio homes that we're trying to squeeze into this property? I, I believe it to be 16 houses or 16 lots versus 15. But OK, um, but those but those uh, those lots are important because it's the product where it's the we're trying to build for for a certain type of home. Okay. We're trying to build for that. Uh, for that empty nester. Like they're selling a home on a lot like that and wanting to move into a home like we're going to build. So you don't see a market for those six SF9 homes in this location? I think there's a market for, for everything today. Uh, if you ask, ask you know, that, that honestly, but, but I think that the home over the overwhelm, and I, and I think there were support letters that came in that, that, that stated, uh, that they were looking for a home mm. that looked like this because right now you've got to move to a subdivision called Glen Abbey uh, off of uh, Keller Springs uh, that Hawkins Wellwood and Bob Thompson are building in, um, or you've got to move up to the star or not the star, um, 
Legacy West or you've got to move to Stonebar. You, there's not an option that's like this in West Plano for, for, a, for a downsizing person to move into. Uh, for the most part, I mean, they might I mean, they could live in a townhouse, but this is a this is a good this is a really good product. Yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you. Mr. Gibbons. Uh, what are your thoughts on the uh, gentleman's suggestion to flip the lots at the end so you get an extra one instead of? That's that was the one question I forgot to answer. So. Uh, so all that, although I did not share these results uh, with Mr. Jane prior to this meeting, um, I did do that layout that he requested uh, or asked me to do. And um, here, here are the results of that. So it costs more to build, number one, which isn't the primary, it's, it's negligible. Um, uh, but five of the 19 lots become front entry that face Turtle Creek. So if you have, so if you take that, that L shape, uh, where you take the, the alley out to the side, the lots that face south, instead of having that landscape buffer, uh, right there, you're going to have like front entry garages and driveways. If you have any kind of a standard pad that a builder would build, I mean, you could, you could say, well, like it technically meets this requirement, but it doesn't, it doesn't meet like a marketable pad requirement. So you, so another alternative you could say, well, you could do, um, you could do multiple alley exits, right? And you could make them rear entry. Okay. Um, well, uh, but then you're increasing costs, you're adding another alley exit, uh, and you lose lots or at least one lot. Um, and, uh, and basically, I mean, to, and to me, not that this is a concern of the um, a concern of the uh, commissioners tonight, is that by the time you do all that, you you might as well just do it how how the existing zoning is today, right? It doesn't um, because you're going to end up like I was saying, you have those five lots that don't have a marketable pad. Um, in addition to that, it reduces the pad depths five feet, so I've got an eighty-seven foot. 87 foot deep pad on average. It reduces that five, by five feet, I calculated it, on all lots, uh, making the downstairs master more challenging. Uh, and it direct, directly impacts 13 lots. Uh, five of the lots have in, end up having a 10 foot rear yard instead of a 20 foot rear yard. Um, or if you have a 20 foot rear yard, you basically you crowd the pad again. It, it, it makes it to where you, you, can't, you can't get the, I mean, like you gotta go technically, you can have a really small, really small closet and a really small bedroom and you know you could but it's not marketable for someone that's going to spend that type of money on a house uh it reduces a lot depth on average by three feet um and uh like i said it's not not any of y'all's concern but but that translates to twenty one thousand dollars a lot for me uh so big picture in my opinion and uh and, and i have met with mr jane several times uh, to discuss it, um, and that's one reason why I, I I came up with that landscape buffer, because I felt like that was a if I put a really high quality installation on the south and north end of this project, I felt like that would mitigate. It would be obviously like the end of a block is very important. Like great the side elevation that needs to be all brick. You need to have iron so you don't have like gray fences over time. And with this with that landscape buffer, we can have benches and some big meaty uh, you know, landscaping right there, uh, that that would offset, uh, 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 his concern. So I guess my question then is if that's the case, how do, how do we know that you're actually going to build those landscape buffers on either end? It doesn't appear that that's of any, any part of any of this. So where's the, where's the teeth to make sure that happens? I mean, I, I don't, I, don't, I guess I guess maybe there aren't. Obviously, if you're rezoning this to uh, uh, to to PD four twenty three, there wouldn't be teeth. But I would say I would think if you have a concept plan uh, that shows the landscape buffer. But here's the problem with the landscape buffer: is that if I don't have a homeowners association because I'm planning to get annexed into the homeowners association, the homeowners association needs to be there to to uh, maintain that. 
but um, but I've made a commitment to them to be annexed, and I've made a commitment to do it. But the is that fair? Well, I'm not sure it is because you just sort of argued against yourself. You're saying if, if it's going to be subject to an HOA, then they've got to maintain it. So maybe that's not a good idea after all. So I'm not really sure where you're going after all. Well, it would be maintained by the homeowner as right. opposed so to. Does that mean so I can't, not? but you wouldn't have a. What I'm saying is, is you would you would designate it as a side yard of a lot. You would have an increased side yard setback to 15 feet, uh, as opposed to. But basically, we would remove that. So you have the curb plus 12 and a half feet for the right of way, and then you instead of 15 feet to the side of the house, which would be the setback uh, without the landscape buffer, it would be a five foot side yard setback and a 10 foot landscape buffer. So it would just, the houses would be in the same location. It would just be who would maintain that, that, that side yard, right? That would be, that would be the difference. Um, that, does, does that make sense? So it's, it's going to go in regardless, but if, but it would either be a side yard or a landscape buffer. And thank you. Let's do this, Commission. Let's focus on 1A right now, the zoning, and then we're having some discussions about 1B, the site plan, and perhaps maybe making a landscape buffer requirement in the site plan. But let's focus on 1A right now, um, the zoning. Um, any other comments, questions on 1A on the zone? Commissioner Kerry? I definitely would ask you to get strong consideration of concerns on the, the of water. I think the citizens have good concerns there. And uh, and I also urge you to rethink the parking a little bit on this because uh, it's, it's my opinion that that could be a problem for this, this neighborhood as I drove around it. And um, while I know you think that it might not be an issue, I, 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 some of the citizens think it would, and I think it might be. And I think uh, you guys need to make sure you, you've solved that. Okay. Any further co comments or discussion by the commission? Mr. Chairman. One second. That goes into the zone. Where? Okay. Go ahead. You want to address that? Right. We were just discussing whether it's appropriate to condition the zoning or wait for the site plan and, and whether or not, because the zoning doesn't extend the full distance of the uh, Turtle Creek Drive, whether it's actually effective to condition the zoning. Um, but I think it could be because it's still the majority of the distance. Um, so I think it could be effective if the commission wants to add a condition to the plan development district. Um, it, would, it would still be largely effective and we could enforce it on the concept plan and move it through the development process. And so any addition of a landscape buffer would need to be on 1A and not 1B then? Is it, that correct? It would be on 1A and then it would affect 1B. Okay. Would, would that only be on the south side or would it also be on the north side? It would only, well, you could do it on both. It's just, I, I want the commission to be aware that because there is a limited geography to the but it still puts it into the zoning and then on the south side you have homes that are there so what we're talking about is really just the north side of of <laughs> turtle creek well right south side of the south side of the, the property but the north side of turtle creek so. yes yeah well but i'm saying if you look at the on the north side of the entire property don't you have homes patio homes facing the development there no those face the other direction <clears throat> Oh, it's a side yard on the north side? Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, looking through this and hearing all the discussions, what we're having here, we, we recognize, I think, first of all, um, this is an ideal solution to those who are wanting to scale down. A lot of us are now becoming empty nesters, and one of the questions that pops up is where we want to move, that type of thing. And the residents that are in Willow Bend expect a certain quality of their homes, evident by where they live. And I think this is a good stepping stone for them to scale scale back and still be able to have grandchildren, et cetera, coming in. I think as we go through this whole process, as we get through the design, there'll be a significant amount of civil work and civil plans that'll be reviewed by the city before you even begin to turn dirt, okay? 
and that will i hope will address the hydrology questions that we're seeing here but also you know it's also going to look at things like emergency entrances and exits and then it's also going to help with, again with the stormwater runoff so uh, looking at what he's proposed i i suggest i'm all for uh, this zoning change okay. okay so is that i'm all for it or is that a motion and then are you i'd like to make a motion sorry, are you I'd like to make a the, the potential landscape buffer that's being discussed on the north side of Turtle Creek Drive. I think we de I think we need to have that landscape okay, buffer. And that needs to be part of the motion. Okay, so I'd like to make a motion that we recommend for approval the subject on 1A inclusive of the landscape buffer on the south side of the al south alley and the north alley and subject to Rescinding the specific use permit number 58 for country club and private club. Okay. That we have to do separately, the precision. But the I want to make sure we're clear. The landscape buffer is the proper location for purposes of the the ordinance. The northern side of Turtle Creek Drive. Would that be the correct way to address it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I, I'd say th they'll place a landscape buffer along Turtle Creek Drive and Castlegate Drive, and we can craft that that language consistent with it would be the the northern. It, we'll want to make sure we craft the language very explicitly. It'll it will likely be the northern side of Turtle Creek Drive between Shattuck Boulevard and Old Westbury Lane because it'll need to be really precise. Exactly. Okay. So do you have enough there for the motion? Yes. Okay. <laughs> is there a second on the motion? <laughs> All right. So what we have is we have a motion to approve uh, agenda item 1A with the addition of a mandatory landscape buffer, which is to be located on the north side of Turtle Creek Drive. Is that correct? Correct, Commissioner Hall. Okay, and a second by Commissioner Carey. So I know that's clear as mud. Please cast your vote. Mr. Chairman, it's also yes. on the south side of Castlegate Drive as well. I'm sorry. I, I just want to be south. clear. Yes, I'm sorry. The north side of Turtle Creek and the south side of Castlegate Drive. Chair Barbera, can I ask a question? Yes. Perhaps before we get there. I know this rezoning is only for a portion of the plan development district. Is there any concerns about applying standards to the entire district even though we're representing just a portion does that does any part of that landscape buffer stretch into the part that was sf9 a little bit of it does it looks like i guess i'm asking because the zoning that we're rezoning right now the portion does not extend fully along the frontage of Turtle Creek and Castle Gate. So. Right. Right. I think, I hope the commission is aware of that. We'll just have to recognize that on the plans when they come in. Right. That it won't be, we won't be able to catch it through the zoning process on the SF9 property. That the, the I'm sorry, the property that's currently zoned patio home. Right. The Western property. Right. So then that would not include the landscape buffer for the full length of those two. It wouldn't include, we're essentially trusting that Mr. Shattuck is going to extend the full length. Right. Well, it wouldn't make sense just to put some in one area and not the other. So exactly. I'm comfortable with uh, the applicant's history in the city and the history with this uh, subdivision around there that that will be done appropriately and take him at his word therefore so we have a motion and we have a second i believe we've cast our votes they're already on the screen so the motion uh, <laughs> one a carries with a vote of eight to zero uh you, you can have a seat now mr uh, now action on one b which will be a separate motion move approval of item one b subject to council approving of item one a Second. We have a motion to approve 1B by Commissioner Downs and a second by Commissioner Gibbons. Please cast your vote. Agenda item 1B carries with a vote of 8-0. Now I believe it's an appropriate 
to make a motion to call a public hearing to rescind the Country Club SUP. I'd like to make a motion that we call a public hearing to rescind the specific use permit number 58 for Country Club and Private Club. Second. Right, we have a motion to call a public hearing to rescind the SUP as stated by Commissioner Horner and a second by Commissioner Downs. Please cast your vote. Are you able to put us back up there for something that's not there? How about we just do a hand? We, can we do a hand yeah, please? We, all in favor, please raise your right hand. And that carries with a vote of eight to zero. All right. Thank you. With that said, we are now on to agenda item 2A. Um, again, this uh, has a companion piece while we read both items. Agenda item number 2A is a public hearing zoning case 2021-008. Request to amend plan development 94 retail on 2.2 acres located at the northeast corner of 15th Street and Greenway Drive to allow restaurant cafeteria as permitted uses and to modify development standards which may include but are not limited to parking. Zone Plan Development 94 Retail. Applicant is Greenway Village Limited. Agenda Item 2A is a revised site plan. Greenway Village Block 1, Lots 2 and 3. Shopping Center on two lots on 1.6 acres located at the northeast corner of 15th Street and Greenway Drive. Zone Plan Development 94 Retail. Applicant, again, is Greenway Village Limited. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm Meredith Herbst, Planner with the Planning Department. This is a request to amend, amend Plan Development 94 Retail to allow restaurant cafeteria uses and modify parking requirements to accommodate this use. A revised site plan accompanies this request to show the proposed parking requirements, but no new construction is proposed at this time. Next slide, please. When this site developed in the early 70s, it was rezoned from single family residence two to plan development 34 neighborhood services. Um, the PD regulations at the time did not affect the uses permitted in the district, but the neighborhood services zoning district required a specific use permit for restaurants and cafeterias with, without drive-in service. Despite this requirement, site plans that showed restaurant uses were approved for this site in 1972 and later in 1978. When the zoning ordinance was updated in 1986, the neighborhood's service zoning district was consolidated into the retail district. And for reasons unknown, the stipulations for the subject property for, the, for PD 94 um, were changed to prohibit restaurant uses. Despite the zoning restrictions in place over the past 50 years, the restaurant uses have existed on the site since its initial development. This discrepancy was only realized because of recent procedural changes that have allowed the planning department staff to review applications for certificates of occupancy. The zoning request is intended to clean up the existing language and ensure the property complies with zoning regulations. Next slide, please. So as the area exists today, there are single family residences to the north and to the west um, across this um, to the south across 15th Street, there's a shopping center, and to the east, there's a convenience store and some vehicle related uses. Next slide, please. So, the land use plan designates this subject property as neighborhood commercial. Neighborhood commercial centers are intended to serve adjacent residential neighborhoods and include grocery stores, drug stores, and small retail and service uses. Restaurant uses are considered service uses in other land use categories and other chapters of the interim concept comprehensive plan. Um, and additionally, the use tables in our zoning ordinance in Article 14 indicate that restaurant cafeteria uses are in the service use category. Um, the proposed amendment to PD 94R allows um, to allow restaurant cafeteria uses is in conformance with the neighborhood commercial designation of the interim comprehensive plan and will serve the adjacent area as part of the existing shopping center. Next slide, please. The subject property contains two lots. This is the revised site plan that's associated with the zoning case um, for Greenway Village Block 1, Lots 2 and 3. Based on the zoning ordinance um, parking requirements, Lot 2 would be two parking spaces short and Lot 3 would be 10 parking spaces short with the restaurant space that is existing in this development at, at this time. However, to date, the Property Standards Division of the Neighborhood Services Department, the City of Plano, has not received any complaints regarding 
um, a lack of parking or parking on either of these lots. So next slide, please. Um, this is the proposed PD-94R language. The proposed stipulations allow the existing park parking situation to remain for the building as they exist as, um, as of the state. Um, the April 8th date is when they submitted their zoning application. Um, future building expansions or redevelopment of the property will require the property to comply with the standard parking requirements within Article 16 of the zoning ordinance. Given that restaurant uses are typically found within shopping centers and have existed on this site since its initial development almost 50 years ago, and that this request resolves conflicts with the zoning ordinance and is in conformance with the interim comprehensive plan, staff, reports, staff supports the requested amendments. Next slide, please. Um, we've received three letters signed by property owners within 200 feet of the zoning boundary. Three of um, these three letters were in opposition. Next slide, please. Um, in addition to these three letters, there was one neutral response that was received via the online zoning response map. Um, so we have a total of four responses. Next slide, please. Um, so this is the revised site plan. Thank you. Um, so a revised site plan for Greenway Village, block one, lots two and three that shows the shopping center on the two lots at the northeast corner of 15th Street and Greenway Drive accompanies this request. Next slide, please. The purpose of this revised site plan is to show the proposed parking requirements, but no new construction is proposed at this time. Um, so zoning case 2021-008 uh, with the pr previously mentioned PD amendments is recommended for approval and the revised site plan is recommended for approval subject to city council approval of zoning case 2021-008. This concludes staff's presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Meredith. Any technical questions for staff? Mr. Downs? Yeah, one of the letters in opposition mentioned a drive-through or something, but I don't see anything proposed to be adding a drive-through to the restaurant and I'm also not quite sure how you'd meet your parking requirements with a drive-through. Of course, um, yes, we have specific stacking requirements in our zoning ordinance um, for uh, drive through restaurants. So if they were proposing a drive through restaurant, it would have needed to be shown on the revised site plan. We have communicated this with the applicants so they are aware of these regulations. So we're really just cleaning this up because there's been restaurants on that site for 20 or 30 years, basically. Yes, okay. sir. That's kind of what I thought. Any other question, technical questions for staff? Yeah, thank you. All right, we'll go ahead and open the public hearing. Does the applicant wish to address the commission? They are only available if the commission have any questions for them. Does the commission have any questions for the applicant? No? How about any other speaker? Clark? We do. We have Peter Cavanaugh. Mr. Cavanaugh? I'm sorry. Oh, oh sorry. I'm sorry. Any questions for Mr. Cavanaugh? No? All right. Any further speaker cards? No, there are not. All right. I will then close the public hearing. You can find comments in discussion to the commission and staff. Move approval item 2A. Second. We have a motion to approve item, agenda item number 2A by Commissioner Downs with a second by Commissioner Stone. Please cast your vote. And the agenda item 2A carries with a vote of 8-0 about agenda item 2b we have a motion on that Move approval item 2b second All right. commissioner downs has moved to approve agenda item 2b with a second by commissioner stone please cast your vote on 2b and agenda item 2b carries the vote with an 8-0 as well we will now move on to our non-public hearings, and our first item is agenda item number three. Non-public hearing items, the presiding officer will permit public comment for items on the agenda not posted for a public hearing. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests, length of the agenda, and to ensure meeting efficiency, it may include a cumulative time limit. Speakers will be called in order cards are received until the cumulative time is exhausted. 
Agenda item number three is a facade plan. Billingsley Office Building Edition, Block B, Lot 4. Professional General Administrative Office on one lot on 10.4 acres located on the east side of Plano Parkway, 1,630 feet south of Park Boulevard. Zone Regional Commercial and located within the Dallas North Tollway Overlay District. Applicant, the residences of Austin Ranch, number one limited. Before we start, I'd like the record reflect that Commissioner Gibbons has um, recused himself on agenda item number three. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, the subject property is located within the regional uh, commercial zoning district. The regional commercial zoning district is intended uh, as an architectural and cultural district. Uh, the building materials requirements within the RC district are intended to ensure the use of high quality, durable materials along the Dallas North Tollway. Next slide, please. Here you can see the facade plan submitted by the applicant. Uh, the RC district requirements uh, stipulate that 80% of the building's exterior consists of uh, clay fired brick, native stone, um, or tile, or combination of these materials. The remaining 20% can be uh, any other material that's permissible under the building code. Next slide, please. Here you see the second page of that facade plan showing the parking garage. Parking garages in the RC district are held to the same standard. Next slide, please. Here's a breakdown of the proposed materials for the office building. Uh, the proposed parking garage meets the standards of the RC zoning district. Uh, so. 80% you know, must conform to those standards and the remaining 20% can be uh, any alternative material. The last row shows the amount of variance that's requested on those alternative materials. You see on the north elevation, uh, they're requesting seven additional percent above the permissible 20%, 11% on the south, 1.15% on the east, and then the west elevation conforms. Next slide, please. As outlined in the applicant's letter that was included in your packet, the purpose of this variance request is to provide a building consistent with uh, existing office buildings in this development. Uh, this office park development started south of International uh, Parkway uh, with properties that are zoned Light Industrial 1. They're not, they're not subject to the RC district standards. The applicant would like to continue this office park development with a consistent architectural style. Uh, the subject property is shown with the star. Uh, the two properties immediately to the south um, are part of the office park and received similar variances in 2018 and in 2013. Um, while the proposed building des design does not completely satisfy the RC material requirements, the proposed variation will complement the existing business park and continue the existing aesthetic in the area. Uh, for these reasons, uh, staff recommends approval of the item as submitted. The applicant is here to give a presentation. Uh, that concludes my remarks and I'm available to answer any questions. Any technical questions for staff? Thank you, Craig. Thank you. Does the applicant wish to address the commission? Come on, Deb. Uh, good evening. My name is Lucilo Peña. I am at 1722 Ruth Street, uh, Suite 770, Dallas 75201. Um, there are two primary reasons for the request for this uh, variance for the office building. Uh, the one working in the campus that we've already built, um, I think this is our eighth office building there. And then the other one is the challenges of the energy code. And there are two things that are working in different directions. The energy code is in simple terms, and our architect uh, who did, uh, uh, Maria Gomez with GFF, who did uh, International Business Park 17, who is right next to us, she can explain it in more detail. But on the one hand, you're trying to reduce the amount of glass because of uh, heat gain, and then you don't want it to be reflective either. So part of the pattern that you see on the glass is what we call frit which is putting a pattern on the inside of the glass, and that's already reflected and existing in the first office building. 
So those are the two main reasons. We pushed the amount of glass as high as we could, and the overall buildings, you saw the facades for the east and west that are the more significant ones. The north and south are both very short facades. So the overall building, the percentage of glass is uh, 78.59, I believe. So we're off by about 1.4, and we push it as much as we can. I'd like to say that we have had this conversation about the challenges of meeting the energy code with the development staff over the years, and it's something that we always uh, struggle with. So with that said, if I can just show you what the other buildings in the area look like. Uh, next slide, right, this is uh, International Business Park 15. Uh, this is also in Plano, and at the time that we built this, this is about a 50, 52% glass. So this was built, this does not require a variance because it's not in the district. Then the next uh, slide, this is adjacent to it, and this we got a variance in 2013. Next slide. This is International Business Park 17, which is currently uh, being leased. And you can see what I'm talking about in the glass, that it is all glass, but it's a fritted pattern that has different densities, and it goes inside the glass. So it's, it's actually baked into it. It's not something that happens over time. Uh, I'd like to point out, I won't get into a lot of the details, but when we asked for the variance for this building, the overall for the building glass was 73.6%, and what was required was 80. We have since worked on this one with the new glass types, et cetera, and we've gotten it as high as 78.59. So if we go to the next slide, this is the elevation of the previously approved and built office building. This is a four-story office building. Next slide, please. This is the one we're requesting the variance for. This is, as I pointed out, the north and south elevations are on the top, and the majority of the east and west elevations. You can see it's glass, some without frit and some with frit. Last slide. Here are renderings of what this uh, building would look like. Uh, similar to the treatment of the other, so it would be in addition to this uh, office park. And uh, this is not a variance, but you might notice that there are some upper level balconies with uh, landscaping that will be in planters. And uh, this is one of the lessons learned uh, from the COVID experience is that people will want more outdoor space and the ability to get fresh air. So this is gonna provide options on the ground floor, the fourth floor, and the fifth floor to be able to go outside and have air. So this is just something that you might be seeing more of. And I'm happy to answer any questions. And as I mentioned, our architect, uh, Maria Gomez, is also here, and she can answer any questions. Thank you. Does the commission have any questions? Mr. Commissioner Stone? Yes, thank you. Um, how close to reality would you say the color on our on our printed material here is for the blues and the grays? Is this a really close representation of what we'll actually see? If we go to the slides, if we, if we can back up on the slides, uh, go one more, two more back. Okay, the next one, there, no, one more up. That building is built, well, two <laughs> more the other direction, sorry. That yeah. building is built. So it will very much match the glass that is there. So that building, as, as I said, is built. So the renderings can be a little tricky on the blue-gray yes. yes. uh, situation. But this is a fairly low reflective glass. So the challenge is lower reflectivity, mm -hmm. and then you meet the energy code through Frit. But like, it, it would match I, this. I like the look, and I think it'll be a great addition to your, to your area there. So Thank you. We're also excited about it. <laughs> what we're really talking about is a one and a half percent. That's variance. correct. Any other questions for the applicant? Right. That then, uh, do we have any speaker cards? Thank you. Do we have any speaker Thank cards you. on the aisle? No, we do not. All right. Can't open and close the public hearing because this is a non-public hearing aisle. Move but approval with no item three. Huh? Move approval item three. All right. I have a motion to approve agenda item number three by Commissioner Downs with a second by Commissioner Walters. Please cast your vote. And agenda item number three carries with a vote of 7-0. Great looking project. And we will move to agenda item four. 
Agenda item number four is a preliminary site plan, McDermott Square, Block A, Lot 9, Medical Office and Retail on one lot on 1.0 acre located on the north side of McDermott Road, 815 feet east of Independence Parkway. Zone plan development, 400 retail. Applicant is MNR Estates, LLC. The purpose for the preliminary site plan is to show the proposed medical office and retail development. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. A masonry screening wall is required along the eastern property boundary due to the existing residential zoning district. However, the applicant is proposing an irrigated living screen in lieu of the required masonry screening wall. The landscape screening wall is consistent with the property to the north and if maintained properly may grow taller than the required six foot wall and provide better screening. In instances where the Planning and Zoning Commission believes an irrigated living screen may better meet the screening requirements, it may allow an irrigated living screen in lieu of a masonry screening wall. The preliminary site plan is recommended for approval subject to the Planning and Zoning Commission finding that a living screen with plant materials approved by the Planning and Engineering Departments will provide better screening and granting a waiver to the masonry screening wall requirement along the eastern property line. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any technical questions for staff on agenda item four? Thank you very much. Does the applicant wish to address the commission? No, but they are available for any questions. Right. We have questions for the applicant. Do we have any drawings or renderings of this proposed living screen? Because this is a little higher burden than just ask for it, and we need to be shown something. Do we have anything? That I do not know. We, we do not have any drawings that show the screen specifically. It does have to be a solid irrigated living screen that grows to six feet within two years of installation. So that's the requirements in the ordinance. Okay. Can we ask the uh, applicant what type of uh, yeah, what's I, he proposing? I'd like to hear something because yeah. if we're being asked to, to grant a waiver. Mr. Shanez uh, Tal Talaker, is he on the line? Apparently, he's he's not uh, with us. Okay. The preliminary site plan does show that they're doing, um, I believe, evergreen trees, some sort of evergreen trees that our landscape architect will work with them on. I just, I, I know that one thing was mentioning that there's an existing living screen on an adjacent property, so I was hoping that we might be able to see some photos of what that, of that, and that we're looking at. If, if, if the applicant doesn't wish to address the commission or answer any questions about granting a waiver, I would suggest that we table item four until such time the applicant can address the commission and would move therefore to table item four. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, I might point out as the material tells us, the uh, proposed medical center is gonna be 10 or 11 feet higher in elevation than the neighbor that will be looking at the screen wall. Uh, can you visual, let's visualize a six foot masonry screen wall, but the building behind it is another five or six feet taller. Uh, I don't think a masonry screen wall would do any service to the property. I think a living screen would, would be a good idea. I've got a motion to table because the applicant hasn't addressed us about the, okay. his, his request for a waiver. I'm obtaining any other motions as well. If there's no second on the motion. Second the motion to table. All right. We have a motion to table to item number four till uh, June. What's our next meeting? June. I don't want to delay it by any means. Or so it's be June. June 21st. 21st. Uh, and a set, uh, second by Commissioner Horn. Uh, please cast your vote on the motion to table four. Motion to table carries a vote of eight to zero. Our next agenda item is agenda item number five. Agenda item number five is a call for public hearing. Request to call a public hearing to amend plan development 195 corridor commercial on 7.1 acres located on the south side of Park Boulevard, 385 feet east of Alma Drive. Applicant is Park Alma Plano Venture number one LP. Good evening. Uh, the Zoning ordinance requires that where a planned development district and company encompasses more than one lot that all property owners of the district sign the zoning petition. 
Uh, the applicant represents one of three lots within this plan development district. They have signed a zoning petition. Uh, the other two property owners have not, uh, one being uh, Dallas Plano Storage, SPE LLC. Uh, the applicant was unable to get them to sign a zoning petition. The third property owner is the city. The city cannot sign a zoning petition. So for these reasons, the applicant is requesting that the commission call a public hearing. The applicant uh, is, would like to modify the PD stipulations to remove a restriction for a car wash. Uh, the commission initiate, if the commission calls this public hearing, that's, that would just be to initiate the rezoning pro process, not to approve the requested change. It's recommended that the Planning and Zoning Commission call a public hearing for this purpose. Thank you, Craig. Any questions for staff? No? All right. Does the applicant wish to address the commission? No, he does not. I assume we have no speaker cards on the item? No, we do not. Right. We can find uh, comments and discussion to the commission and staff. Recommend that PNZ calls a public hearing for this purpose. Second. Second. Right. We have a motion to call a public hearing on agenda under item number five by Commissioner Gibbons with a second by many, but we'll give it to Commissioner Downs. <laughs> Please cast your vote on agenda item five. And agenda item five carries with a vote of eight zero. Agenda item number six. Agenda item number six is another call for public hearing. Results of legislative actions. Request to call a public hearing to consider amendments to various sections of the zoning ordinance and sub subdivision ordinance pertaining to recent legislative actions and to ensure compliance with state law. Applicant is City of Plano. Good evening. My name is Melissa Spriegel, Senior Planner with the Planning Department. The 87th Texas Legislature has recently passed um, House and Senate bills, which will require ordinance updates, one being House Bill 1475, which will impact the criteria the Board of Adjustment considers for variances to the zoning ordinance, and another being Senate Bill 1585, which will affect the designation of historic districts, partly impacting the Neighborhood Conservation District. Staff is reviewing other legislative items as well, which may require additional changes to the ordinances. So this request is intended to cover all ordinance amendments that may be needed as a result of the legislative actions. The deadline for the governor to act is June 20th, 2021. And unless vetoed, most bills will become effective September 1st, 2021. Given this upcoming effective date, the process for ordinance amendments needs to begin immediately. Therefore, staff recommends the Planning and Zoning Commission call a public hearing to consider amendments to various sections of the zoning ordinance and subdivision ordinance pertaining to recent state legislative actions and to ensure compliance with state law. And I can answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions for staff? No. Staff is the applicant, I suppose, on this, so I won't ask if we have any speaker cards. No, we do not. All right. I will confine comments and discussion to the commission and staff. We move we call a public hearing to consider amendments to various sections of the zoning ordinance and subdivision ordinance pertaining to recent state legislative actions and ensure compliance with state law. I'll second it. We have a motion to approve agenda item six by Commissioner Downs, a very well stated motion on my name, and a second by uh, Commissioner Carey, I believe. Please cast your vote on calling a public hearing on agenda item six. The item carries with a vote of eight to zero. I will now move to agenda item number seven. Agenda item number seven is discussion and direction. Request for discussion and direction pertaining to community center, public building, and library uses. Good evening, Commissioners. Meredith Herbst with the City of Plano Planning Department. Uh, Planner, this um, is a request for discussion direction pertaining to community center, public building, and library uses. At the May 17th, 2021 Planning and Zoning Commission meeting, the Commission called the public hearing to bring forward a zoning case on the June 21st Planning and Zoning Commission meeting to consider amendments to Article 8 definitions, Article 14, allowed uses and classifications, and various sections of the zoning ordinance pertaining to community center, public building, and library uses. The purpose of this agenda item is to discuss these, the issues pertaining to these uses prior to holding the public hearing. Over the years, amendments to the zoning ordinance have consolidated and streamlined some land use regulations, 
but in doing so may have removed some, some flexibility. Um, one example of this is the use classification of libraries. Past planning records identify libraries using terms such as library, public library, municipal library, and public library facility. However, the zoning ordinance did not find these uses, nor put these uses in the use tables. The public building um, term has also been used to identify libraries, but this term was not in the zoning ordinance and was only defined in the zoning ordinances between 1986 and 2015. Additionally, the term community center was not used in past planning records to identify libraries. Currently, the, commu the community center use, which needs a specific use permit in residential zoning districts, is defined to include libraries. However, the community center definition has explicitly included libraries only since 2015, and prior to 1999, community center uses did not need SUPs in residential districts. Thus, libraries have existed in residential zoning districts without specific use permit requirements. Given the facts of these cases, staff believes the requirement for libraries to have an SCP, which makes library expansions more demanding, was an unintentional oversight in the context of a much larger complex project. Next slide, please. Community centers and libraries are often public uses. They are often owned and are operated by a governmental agency. So in discussing these specific uses, it's important to consider the breadth of public public uses, various governmental agencies that may be involved, and the differences between public and private uses. Most public agencies are led by elected officials, so the constituents impacted by the land use decisions of the public agency may gain relief through their representatives. For city of planet facilities, land use decisions are based on policies and regulations adopted by the city, such as the Community Investment Program, Master Facilities Plan, Comprehensive Plan, and Zoning Ordinance. The beneficiaries of, public of, pub of a public facility include those in proximity of a use, while a private owner or operator is not obligated to serve those adjacent or nearby. Specifically, as it relates to libraries and community centers, municipalities traditionally provi provide these types of services and amenities in to residents in a neighborhood or residential setting. Additionally, in some instances, public agencies are not legally bound by the zoning ordinance, and the public agency may comply with the zoning requirements as a matter of courtesy and mutual respect. Next slide. Um, so in considering some possible amendments to these um, uses, the um, staff has offered some questions and provided some options to help guide this discussion and direction. Um, just how should the zoning ordinance classify public library uses, what facilities should or should not fall within a particular classification, um, and what specific public agencies and nonprofits are involved. Next slide, please. So an option we have, um, this first option divides community center into two uses, public and private, and it removes the private recreation facility or area use as it would be somewhat redundant of the private community center use. Um, private community centers would retain the current community center um, permissions and public community centers would be allowed by right in all zoning districts. This will resolve, um, this option will resolve the current concerns, but it will require specific findings um, on the adopting ordinance to ensure that an adequate distinction is made between the two uses. Next slide, please. The second option retains the private recreation facility area or use um, removes the community center use and adds government facility as a new use. Government facilities would be allowed by right in all zoning districts. Um, so this acknowledges state and federal law that exempts some federal, some governmental land use, but it is written very restrictively, so it would not allow, allow a broad interpretation and in quasi-public or entities of the state to gain development rights. Additionally, this option better accounts for the existing private recreation facility or area SUPs um, because the definition and allowed locations for this use would remain unchanged. So this option is uh, staff's preference. Given this information, staff recommends that the Planning and Zoning Commission provide direction pertaining to the community center, public building, library, and related uses um, prior to the public hearing at the next Zoning Commission meeting. Um, and so this concludes staff's presentation, and I am happy to answer any questions and get your direction. Right. Thank you. Any technical questions for staff? 
I see multiple hands. Commissioner Horn. Meredith, I, I need a little help with the definition of private recreation facility in that something like Lifetime Fitness, which is, you know, it's uh, more than a gym. And, you know, what's it? Because in this definition, we have an option too. You said it's owned and or operated by a nonprofit. Last I checked, Lifetime Fitness is a for-profit facility. Is there a definition on private? I mean, that's yeah, different we, from that? Sorry to interrupt. Um, we do have a health fitness center use that covers just general private nonprofit uses that we use for LA Fitness, Lifetime Fitness, Pilates Studios, et cetera. Is that, a, again, from the, the distinction on private, is it commercial? Would that be, I know it's commercial, but is that the definition we're using for lifetime of uh, uh, family fitness centers, all these fitness yes. centers? We're yes. calling it commercial fitness center. Yeah, I would have to reference. confirm to see if it says specifically in the definition um, that it's a commercial use, but that's how we have applied it consistently. Correct. Health and fitness center is the classification for yeah. those uses. I don't think commercial is in the definition. We can review that with you. But yes, those uh, businesses that operate gyms that's a health and fitness center for our ordinance. Mr. Vance. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. I, I guess I'm curious and I don't expect you to necessarily know the answer right off the top of your head, but I know that the library over time, uh, the library system anyway, has been benefit of the CIP, but also various grants that they've received I just want to make sure that changing somehow our titling or our representation of what a library is doesn't somehow move them from a type of facility or a type of operation in the city that can receive funds from a government grant or some kind of fund into a different style of classification. So I'm not expecting you to know that off the top of your head, but it's just something that I'd like some kind of assurance from before we say, yeah, this is exactly the way we should go with that. And it'll probably involve a discussion with them over their various funding sources. I, I don't think that it will, but it's one of those unintended consequences that later on we go, wow, I wish we'd known that. We'll check with them and make sure. I can speak to like um, zone or the building inspections department might classify a use as one use under their code, but it's really just under the zoning ordinance that would, it would fall. But we'll definitely confirm that and look into it so we're not making Thank any you. an additional I appreciate the work and I certainly understand the need to clean it up and um, and I like your option too that, that's your deal so I anyway my two cents so we've got one for option two another for option two uh, following up on Commissioner Downs uh, shouldn't we be getting uh, a testimony from uh, Parks Department library people on this why is this a zoning issue today uh, so, they, if you want to speak to it, Hank. Sure, yes, there's an expansion that's proposed for Harrington Library currently, and as staff was reviewing that request, we realized the changes that were made to the zoning ordinance several years ago, and so we needed to bring forth this item to move forward with those improvements to make sure they're consistent with the zoning requirements. Well, Commissioner Downs' question was, was, was based on a, a more technical-oriented uh, question about whether they might be foregoing mm -hmm. uh, funds, federal funds, or, or governmental funds. And uh, I think we should know that uh, definitively uh, before we take this on. So yeah, we'll be happy to run the traps on that and have an answer for you uh, before the next meeting, and we can present that during the public hearing. Because we're just providing feedback to you. This is a discussion item right now. So just a direction in the way that you would like us to go with these options before you or other options. But the hearing will be uh, it's scheduled for two weeks, and we'll have that response for you before then. Mr. Gibbons? So to follow up on Commissioner Horn's uh, question, it seems like the difference between um, the Lifetime Fitness and what would qualify here is that it's nonprofit. So if Lifetime Fitness became a nonprofit, then it would qualify for this, but as long as it's for profit, it does not. Correct? Correct. Okay. Any further questions, comments, or input? I agree with Commissioner Downs that option two is fine with me. And anyone else? Do you have enough to 
go with on that, Christina? I, I just want to clarify, I think a really important element of this definition is not for the general public. As long as someone like Lifetime Fitness is open to the general public, I think that that is a key distinguishing factor. I think most of the time these private recreation facilities are things like homeowners association, recreation type centers. Those are usually limited by very specific geography. So that's usually the way we're utilizing this definition is for HOA type amenity centers. So I think that even if Lifetime Fitness became nonprofit, it would probably still be a health and fitness center because they're still going to be open to the general public, so they wouldn't fit this definition. Okay. Anything further? Do you have enough information there? Okay. And our last item, I believe, is items for a future open meeting agenda. Does anyone have anything they'd like to add? An agenda item on a future meeting? No? All right. Well, at 8.58, we will adjourn. Thank you very much. for It's been a long night, and I appreciate everybody being here and your input. trail network, visit www.bikeplano.org for updated trail system information, as well as maps and on-street bicycling resources. Getting signed up and participating in a community cleanup is easier than you may think. It's a great opportunity for you or a group to help keep Plano beautiful. If you decide to help, your first step is to register online at plano.gov slash community cleanup. Once city staff receives the registration form, they will reach back out to you about the location, supply pickup date, and give you other information. 